Ladies and gentlemen, we now direct your attention to Commissioner Kuhn's box, situated at the home plate side of the Reds' dugout, where the ceremonial first pitch will be thrown out by the former general manager of the Cincinnati Reds and the president emeritus of the National League, Warren Giles. Johnny Bench shaking hands with Warren Giles. There's the commissioner, Bowie Kuhn, and the man in the gray suit is Julian Goodman, the uh, chairman of the board of the National Broadcasting Company. Bill Salatich of the President Gillette right alongside of him. They got pretty good seats tonight. Joe Cronin, who have received a standing ovation in Boston with his my wife, Mildred. Got a, I've seen that uh, congressman with the plaid jacket. That's uh, Mendel Davis of South Carolina. He was the captain of the Democratic team in the annual congressional game. And there's Hank Aaron, not a bad hitter. And we earn sitting here tonight in the commissioner's box enjoying the ball game. Baseball's all-time great hitter. The Reds go on the field getting a roar as they should. They had a club record this year, 108 games, breaking an old mark of the 1970 team. And also they had the best road record in the history of the National League this year. Home record, winning 64 and losing just 17. They are really hard to beat here. On the other hand, the Red Sox have the best road record in the American League, winning 48 and losing just 31. Gary Nolan, he was washed up. One man saved him. That was the president of the Cincinnati Reds, Bob Housen. He didn't pitch the year before last, then last year again. Finally, they decided to operate on him, Tony. He had a calcium spur removed by Dr. Job the Dodger orthopedic man in back of his right shoulder, and he came back to win 15 games. Quite a comeback, was in the minor leagues last year, did not have a decision. Sparky Anderson, his manager, we talked to him before the ball game. We asked him to tell us a little bit about Gary Nolan, his starting pitcher for game number three in Cincinnati. Well, Tony, let me tell you this here now. When I left Thousand Oaks on February 20th, I didn't even consider Gary on our roster. He wasn't even figured of one of the pitchers. He just came along as the spring went along. Larry Starr, Larry Shepard, and I would say Gary Nolan's courage brought him back. That is the whole answer in a nutshell. He will win 20 or more games for Cincinnati in 1976. In 1975, it's a great miracle. Gary Nolan this year won 15 and lost nine. He's still only 27 years old. He broke in as a youngster here. Was an amazing pitcher right from the start until the shoulder miseries got him. He is not a strikeout pitcher, but has outstanding control, Marty, right? Certainly does, Kurt. He walked only 29 batters during the course of the year, and five of those walks were intentional walks. He's on the black outside and on the black inside. All right. In other words, he hits those corners and moves that ball around. He's facing Cecil Cooper, who loves to go after that first pitch in a fastball, and he ripped the foul back out of play. Cooper's had one hit and eight times up so far. He's had one RBI. It'll be Cooper, Doyle, Yastrzemski. Three left-handers in a row for the Red Sox, facing a right-hander. The outfield is around toward right for Cooper. He's a pull hitter. He hits a curveball down to first. Perez has it. The race to the bag, and there's one down. Here you'll notice the outfielders are going to be playing deeper and in Fenway Park. Well, one reason, of course, the wind was blowing in in Fenway Park. Here you have to play deeper because if the ball hits on a hop, it'll bounce over your head. And uh, that's one of the dangers of this artificial surface. It's very hard, and the infielders play deeper, too. Also got to protect those alleys in the outfield, Kurt. Ball scoots out there, gets by, it could be a triple. Danny Doyle's had three hits in seven times. He popped the foul back out of play. I think they've told him to go up there and hit that first pitch. This guy's around the plate. Don't get behind on him. And the first two batters for the Red Sox have been first ball hitters. 0-1 oh, to Doyle, one out. Nobody on, we're just underway. Jastrzemski's on deck, and then Carlton Fisk. Nola works for the fastball, a curve, a changeup. Ground ball to Perez. There he is again. Same play, same spot, two down. And both of them bounced out on curveball. First two Red Sox. Nolan's the kind of pitcher, correct me if I'm wrong, Marty, 
he has a reputation as a breaking ball pitcher, and yet he gets a lot of hitters out with fastballs. He did that against Pittsburgh when he was overshadowed by Candelaria, that great performance. That's right, Tony, and uh, looking back over the season, he may well have had his best fastball all year against the game that you mentioned in Pittsburgh. And yet he didn't get much credit because a youngster by the name of Candelaria struck out 14. Nolan allowed only two runs in that game. Yastrzemski hits a high hopper to Joe Morgan. It's going to be a quick one, two, three inning. And the score at the end of the first half inning, nothing, nothing. The Reds coming to bat. 30-year-old Richard Charles Wise coming back this year to win 19 after winning only three last year. And uh, this ballpark is no stranger to him. In fact, he loves to pitch here. He's done very well. He has pitched a no-hit game against the Reds in this ballpark, and he's pitched a one-hitter here. And the first man he faces, Pete Rose, was talking about that no-hit game. That was back in 71 and June 23rd, and Rose said, man, he never should have had a no-hitter. The first ball up, I beat out to the shortstop. The next <laughs> two, I lined out. But he said he came up with a no-hitter, and I'll give him credit. He had two home runs in that game. Winning 4 nothing. Rick Wise pitched a week ago. He won the final game of the American League playoffs. Beating Oakland. He was a winning pitcher. He had some problems late in the season. But he came back strong against the defending world champion, the A's. He was traded by the Cardinals along with outfielder Bernie Carbo for outfielder Reggie Smith and pitcher Ken Tatum after the 73 season. Pete Rose is two out of eight. Rose, Griffey, and Morgan, they've changed the batting order. They've moved Griffey up to number two to get his speed up there along with Morgan. Morgan will drop from two to three. Wise is primarily a fastball slider. He throws a lot of high stuff. He's not a ground ball pitcher. The first pitch is high to Rose, the ball. Pete Rose, will he get those 3,000 hits? I wouldn't doubt it. He has over 2,500 now. Takes great care of himself. Durable. He should have three or four more years. A ground ball to Doyle. The Red Sox second baseman puts him away, and there's one down. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball. It's intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pitcher's description of the counts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Major League Baseball has the right of approval of the announcers for this event. Now we can play ball. Ken Griffey up. Griffey, two out of seven. One RBI. He got a big one. A big RBI for the Reds to give them a split in Boston when he doubled the left center in the ninth inning. Strike. Griffey beat out over 38 infield hits this year. He must hit a lot of those high choppers, huh, Marty? He does, Kurt, and this ballpark with the artificial surface and the others around the National League are really tailor-made for him. Of course, the National League has mostly artificial surfaces. The Red Sox played at only two in the American League, Kansas City and Chicago's infield, the outfield's natural grass. One ball, one strike to Griffey. He has been clock going to first base in 3.5. That one nearly to the backstop. Same outfield for the Red Sox. Yastrzemski in left, Lynn in center, Evans in right. Sparky Anderson has called it the best defensive outfield one of his teams has ever faced. They're all around, getting to the ball, catching it, and then throwing it, and throwing it accurately. The 2-1 pitch. Foul ball, foul tip into the mitt of Carlton Fist. The infield is Petroselli at third, Burleson at short, Doyle at second, Cooper at first. Fist receiving... The deliveries of Rick Wise. Kurt Sparky did qualify that about this outfield. He did say, I'd like to see them play, or I'm going to have to see them play on artificial surface, where he thinks raw speed is so important. One out, nobody on. We have no score in the last of the first inning. Foul away. Count two and two to Ken Griffey. Perez was kidding him around the batting cage tonight. I want to see you do something. I did more than you did in Boston. <laughs> so I moved him two bases. You only moved him <laughs> one. 
Does that kind of banner sound familiar to Marty, being around that dugout and clubhouse of the Reds all really, year long? It really <laughs> does, Tony. They they give Griffey a hard time referring to him as a punch and Judy hitter, and he said if he can hit 305 every year, he'll take it. I don't blame him. Three and two was Pete Rose, whose ambition was to become the first singles hitter to make $100,000 a year, and he did it. One out, nobody on. We have a full count to Ken Griffey. Griffey's plate is right now a pull hitter about two steps to right. Petroselli's backed up on a 3-2 count. Burleson's in a couple of steps, though, against the speed of Griffey. Bounding ball to second baseman Doyle. And we have two down. So the first three men up for the Red Sox all grounded out. The first two men up for the Reds have bounced out. Here's little Joe Morgan. He's had two hits in seven times. He said, I want to, you know, he's got a great personality. He came over and said, I want to thank you. My wife told me about comparing me to Sugar Ray Robinson, pound for pound. Sugar Ray, probably the greatest fighter of all time. I know Muhammad Ali would argue that. But uh, I said pound for pound last Saturday. Here was the strongest player in the majors. He's little, but he knocked in 94 runs and hit 17 homers. And does everything else. 0 oh, and 1. Perez, the big right handed slugger on deck. Two down, nobody on, no score. That one hitter that Rick Wise pitched, Joe Morgan spoiled it on June 13th with a line drive hit, two out of the ninth inning. Wise winning that one 8 to nothing in a Cardinal uniform. Strike on the inside corner. Good pitch. One ball, two strikes. Wise, like Gary Nolan, has pretty good control. He likes to spot the fastball. His best pitch probably is his slider. He'll throw an off-speed curveball on occasion. I think it's a tougher lineup with Morgan hitting third. Got more speed up on top, and also Morgan can knock in runs and take some heat off Perez and Bench behind him. There's a high fly in the left center. Fred Lynn drifting back, waiting. Three up, three down for Cincinnati. At the end of the first inning, it's nothing, nothing. They had 500,000 ticket applications for the World Series here in Cincinnati, about the same in Boston. Two truly outstanding baseball franchises. Not just city teams, but area teams. They come from Kentucky, Ohio. We saw all the license plates around all over the Midwest here. To watch this club, and up in Boston, it's a New England team. Indiana, West Virginia, big fans also of the Reds. Carlton Fisk looked at a strike, and Nolan's in that strike zone with that first pitch. Fisk has had one hit in six times. He's knocked in two runs. Lynn, a left-hander on deck, and then Pet Vaselli. That's the curveball of Gary Nolan. Nolan's been an outstanding pitcher for the Reds, but he's not had much luck in the World Series. He's made four previous World Series starts, no wins, two losses, and a high earned run average of 5.40. There's a blast deep left. Forget about it. It's gone. A home run for Carlton Fisk. Now well, they ought to have the green wall out there. Ooh, he, that was out of anywhere. Grand yes. Canyon. He got every last bit of that one. Looked like a fastball inside part of the plate about belt high. That They're is jumping on him. He didn't know he's theory. got good control. Let's look at this swing again. Bench appeared to be signaling that he wanted the ball inside, maybe off the strike zone. Belt high, and he knew it's gone. Look at Fisk and Johnny Luck. Foster barely took a look and saw it go. Well, halfway up in that first deck there. What do they call it? The heart of the plate, Marty? That's right, Kurt. And, and I'll tell you, for Gary Nolan to be successful, he cannot pitch up in that area. Here's Fred Lynn, who's had two hits in eight times. They're still buzzing about that tremendous home run by Carlton Fisk, the first homer of this 75 series. Boston leading 1-0. A high fly by Lynn in the left center. Geronimo trotting in for it. One away. So in the first inning, Boston hit the ball on the ground. Second inning, they're up in the air. Rico Petroselli, the leading hitter in this series, along with Rick Burleson, each has had four hits and seven times up. Petroselli is the RBI king 
three RBIs. Neither club has really worn the ball out. Here's a fastball for a call strike. Nothing and one. So a little Perry Como drops behind on the count. One to nothing, Boston. <laughs> he hits a foul ball in back of the Red Sox dugout into the seats. Can he sing? No, he can't <laughs> sing a lick. But that's what we used to call him when he came up. Brooklyn, New York. Folks ran a butcher shop there. Great Yankee fan, signed with the Red Sox. 0 and 2. They play Rico more to pull than anybody else on this Red Sox team, even Carlton Fisk. Concepcion is well over in the hole and deep. One out, nobody on. One to nothing, Red Sox. That pitch is high, a ball, two strikes to Rico Petroselli. A right handed batter, Dwight Evans on deck. There's your defensive setup. And look at Concepcion over there in the hole and Morgan shading second. With two strikes, David moved a couple of steps towards second. Curveball hit down in the hole, base hit in the left field. Nolan hung a curve ahead on the count, one and two. That's a fifth hit for Petroselli, Tony. Here's an example of what artificial service can do. It just picks up speed, picks up an overspin on the graininess of this artificial surface. Ordinary grass, Concepcion might have had a shot. Johnny Bench and uh, Sparky Anderson, I thought, gave us a couple of remarkable interviews in Boston last Sunday during the rain. They were very candid. In fact, if you remember an interview, Johnny Bench said artificial surface should help Boston because they hit a lot of balls in the ground. And we just saw Petroselli ground that one through. Dwight Evans, one out of six in this series. 274 hitter for the season. Hits a fly ball, twisting down the right field line. Griffey racing for it and makes the grab right up against the wall. He disappeared out of our view. That's what Sparky was talking about, raw speed in his outfield. He thinks that Geronimo, and especially Griffey, has more than the Red Sox outfield. He had a long run. He was playing the right center field, which is where Evans hits on occasion. Fine play by Griffey as he gauged himself and that cushion out there. Two outs. Petroselli at first. Rick Burleson's had four hits seven times up. He's a tough out. Pitch of the strike. Looked like a out of any slider. Nothing a one. He's knocked in one run. He was a very capable hitter against the A's too in the American League playoffs. That's a check swing. It's 0-2 to the rooster, Rick Burleson. Marty, as I recall, Gary Nolan has an ex excellent change of pace. In fact, two of them, but he threw very few against Pittsburgh. Just three or four, according to the scouting reports Boston has. Tony, we talked about his fastball in that game. Johnny Bench realized he had an exceptional fastball that night and pretty much went with it. He does, uh, I'll tell you, as far as the National League is concerned, he has possibly or no doubt one of the top two, three changes in all of the National League. The count to Burleson's 0-2. They're playing into the opposite field. Fisk led off this inning with a homer. The Red Sox are leading 1-0. They have Petroselli at first, two away. A two-strike delivery teased him with an outside pitch. You talk about control. Listen to this, my friends. This man, Nolan, walked only 1.2 every nine innings this year. That is really control. Five intentional walks in that group. 0-2 to Rick Burleson. The Red Sox pitcher, Rick Wise, due up next in case Burleson gets on. Wise is a good hitting pitcher. Outside, although he hasn't hit in a couple of years. Boy, that was close. Rick Wise. He's got his hitting glasses on. Petroselli at first, two down. One ball, two strike, pitch coming up. There's the changeup. It's beat the shortstop Concepcion. The flip to Morgan. Sides retired. One run. Two hits. No errors. One left. At the end of an inning and a half, Boston won. Cincinnati nothing. The umpire is assigned to game three of the World Series. Larry Barnett is working the plate. Dick Stello at first. George Maloney of the American League at second. Satch Davidson of the National League is the third base umpire. Art France of the American League covering the left field line. And Nick Colosi of the National League is on the right field line. 
Three powerful right-handed batters come up for the Reds in the last of the second. Perez, Bench, and Foster. Perez looking for his first hit of this series. After knocking in 109 runs during the year and batting 282. They're deep and straight away for him. His power to all field. He'll hit a lot of drives in the right center. Wise gives him a quick slider for a strike. 0 and 1. Wise went to high school in Portland, Oregon, graduating from Madison High. Out there in the Rose City, one and one. And we're getting some action. Pat Darcy, he's been an early warm-up man every game for the Reds. The one-one pitch. That one sunk down to him. First pitch is really sunk. One ball, two strikes to Perez. Pitching coach Stan Williams watches him very closely. That is Rick Wise. As we look at that last pit to see if he follows through completely. He has a habit of pulling back before he gets through his full follow through. He loses his control and his velocity. A one two pitch. Beat foul. Wise played Little League, Babe Ruth League, and American Legion ball. He began in the Phillies organization back in 63. His 11th season in the majors. He led the Boston staff in victories this year with 19. One more than Louis Tion. One ball, two strikes to Perez. Pitching coach Stan Williams watches him very closely. That is Rick Wise. As we look at that last pitch to see if he follows through completely. He has a habit of pulling back before he gets through his full follow through. He loses his control and his velocity. A one-two pitch. Beat foul. Wise played Little League, Babe Ruth League, and American Legion ball. He began in the Phillies organization back in 63. His 11th season in the majors. He led the Boston staff in victories this year with 19. One more than Louis Tion. It'll be Tion against Gullet tomorrow night, by the way. The two men that opened game one of the series. Perez batting, nobody on, nobody out. Poured a fastball, and Perez just a little bit late with it. Johnny Bench waiting. He's had the big hit of this series, I think, so far. That leadoff double to the opposite field in the ninth inning that got the Reds going. Got to wonder right now, as Darcy warms up, if there's something wrong with Nolan. I was wondering the same thing. Pat Darcy, uh, Kurt, you wonder about his warming up so early. Gary Nolan developed tightness in his shoulder that brought about an early ouster in his last start against Pittsburgh, and possibly he could be having the same problem here tonight. Well, well we're trying to check on it. Two and two is the count to Perez. Foul away again. Probably the most, well, they've got so many fine men on this team. They're all personable have a lot of poise, but Perez is probably a popular man as there is on the team, isn't he, Marty? Kurt, I'd say he's probably the most popular man on this ball club. Great influence on Davy Concepcion and the other Latin Americans on the Reds team. Two balls, two strikes. Perez leading off last of the second. Now the count runs to three and two. We're going to pause briefly for identification. This is the NBC television network. Kurt Gowdy, Tony Kubik, and Marty Brenneman back with you here in Riverfront Stadium. A full count to Tony Perez. Boston ahead, one to nothing. Last of the second. There's a drive in the left center. Fred Lynn waiting. And we have one down. Johnny Bench, two hits and eight times up. Kurt, one of the things that they said the outfield, especially for the Red Sox, would have to do here on this artificial surface is move back. It does not appear that Evans nor the center fielder Lynn are back very much. Yastrzemski, of course, is because he doesn't have the wall right behind him, but they're still playing relatively shallow, even for a present bench. It was interesting, as Sparky Anderson commented in Boston, that he had his outfield watch the Red Sox outfielders and play on Sunday the same distances as the Red Sox outfielders were playing. Figured and they knew the wind and knew the ballpark. Of course, a lot depends on who's up. This man's up. You're not too shallow. 
There's a high drive deep down the left field line. Looks like it's going foul, though. He hits a lot of foul home runs. That didn't reach home run territory. But he gets out in front of the ball. It's 3.30 down the left field line here. You might have seen when Marty took you around, wanted to talk about it. Did you ever mention those meters around here, Marty? It's Carter. never talked about much anymore, Kurt. It did when the stadium initially opened in 1970, but I don't think people really pay much attention to him anymore. He hit one 100.58 <laughs> meters, fans. <laughs> the one-strike delivery. One ball, one strike to bench. One out. The Red Sox are ahead. Carlton Fisk hit a home run. The lead off to second, the left field. And that's the scoring thus far. One ball, two strikes. That's that slider. It's his good pitch when he gets it going for him. It's very hard and breaks very quickly. Five, six inches. If he keeps it outside and a little down, it's tough. Wise was hurt by home runs this year. He allowed 34 homers. Those are those high pitches. Bounding ball to Petroselli. He'll have a deep throw. And it's there. Petroselli's playing a marvelous third. Two down. He made a stop in the ninth inning the other day. Looked like he had a pair of tweezers. And he's playing very deeply for Johnny Bench especially. And here's another adjustment that the infielders have to make. They play deeper. And they've got a longer throw. And Bench came close. Half a step. Almost beat it out. Two outs. George Foster's had three hits in eight times. He hit the ball in the nose in the first game. I think a couple of hits. And then uh, lining out. Petroselli, for a fellow who was always going to retire, has played quite a playoff in World Series so far. Kurt, our producer Roy Hammerman got in touch with the trainer of Cincinnati, Larry Starr, and Larry Starr says nothing is wrong with Gary Nolan. All right, two down, nobody on. Pat Darcy still warming up, though, in the red bullpen. One to nothing, Boston leading Cincinnati. Foster steps out a lot. There's Darcy. Foster's played straight away and fairly deep. 300 season for him with 23 homers. High and away, a ball to George Foster. What a pickup he's been by Cincinnati. They've made some shrewd trades. Not only do they have a flowering farm system, but now and then they make a trade that really pays off for them. That's what you have to do. The wise trade has paid off for the Red Sox a year later than they thought. They didn't know he'd have a sore arm last year after they got him from the Cardinals. One ball, one strike, two down, nobody on. The Red Sox leading the Reds, one nothing. Wise working out of that short stretch. Outside, two and one to Foster. Let's check Wise's control this year. He averaged two and a half walks every nine innings. And he averaged, that's good, and five strikeouts every nine innings. Two balls and a strike to George Foster. Fired by the Giants from the Giants. That high fastball riding up on him. For shortstop Frank Duffy and pitcher Vern Gesher. And that was back in May 71 when they made the trade. The Red fans said, who is George Foster? Now they know. Two and two count. Foster keeps doing that to pitchers. Trying to break up their tempo. Foul back. Two down, nobody on, a 2-2 two -two count to George Foster. Kurt, I thought Joe Morgan made an interesting observation around the batting cage today. They were asking about them not hitting up in Boston. And he said, it's World Series pressure. He said, it affects us in the way that we are very anxious. We're swinging at pitches that ordinarily we don't during the season. He said, even I did against Lee, a ball that was two, three inches off the ground. Three and two count. Wise. At a 3-2 count to Perez. He got bench out. Now he runs a 3-2 and two to George Foster. But Dave Concepcion swinging a bat in the on-deck circle. And the Reds 
Cubs have their first base runner. Foster attempted only three steals all year, successful twice. Here's Concepcion coming up. He's had one hit in eight times. He can take the ball deep to right center in the right field. He can pull. Fine all-around shortstop. Came back from a fractured ankle a couple of years ago. He hasn't lost a half a step. Red Sox leading. They have one run, two hits. The Reds have no runs, no hits. You just saw the Reds' first base runner, Foster at first. Cooper plays off the bag a step on him, a holding step off the bag. There he goes. Here's the throw. It's there, and it's true. Foster's up, and he's on the way up there. Looks like the Reds are going to run any time now. And that was not a bad throw either. It looked like Doyle got over a little too late. I don't know if he was surprised by Foster going. And watch Foster. And watch how slowly Denny Doyle gets over. He took that a little bit on the run. The ball was right on the money. He could have short hopped it. Foster winds up at third. Here it is again. This throw is there in time. It appears here on the rerun. It's low. Looks like it might have partially hit the runner, too. An error has been charged on Carlton Fisk. It's allowed Foster to go to third. Well, checking, they say. But I wouldn't think he'd charge Doyle an error in the dirt and everything with that one. <laughs> Alan Ross rushes so as you never know. One ball, one strike. Reds have a runner at third, two down. The Red Sox are leading, one nothing. A left-handed batter, Geronimo, is on deck. We had him swinging at that breaking pitch, a sharp slider breaking away. They have charged Carlton Fisk with an error. Mm. Throwing error. I beg to differ with the three official scores. Well, you, you I don't. <laughs> I, I thought it hit the runner on the, on the rerun. Can't charge an error to the runner. Two balls, two strikes. Wise is throwing a lot of pitches in the inning. There's Foster at third, two down. Charlie Feeney. President of the Baseball Writers Association of America, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, Cliff Keene of the Boston Globe, and Bob Herzl of the Cincinnati Inquirer are the three official scores of the game. A 2 2 delivery. Check swing foul back. Dave Concepcion is the batter here in the last of the second. Sparky Anderson, just 41, despite the silver hair. He was a bat boy for Rod Daydu out of the USC. And Daydu was here tonight, very proud of Fred Lynn and Bill Lynn, who played for him, and Bill Lee. The 2 2 delivery. There's a drive in the right field. Evans is over, and he has it. The side's retired. Evans getting a quick break on that one. No run, no hits, one error, one left at the end of two. 1 0 Boston. Some of the fans around the country have watched all the games of the World Series, and they've seen this Pat Darcy up early Sparky Anderson I asked him about it Marty he said I like to have my long relief man up early warming up in case the starter gets into trouble he's ready to come on in and also a starting pitcher may not have his stuff when he starts the ball game and we want to be ready with somebody I think that's a big thing in Darcy's case uh, Kurt because he was a starter for the Reds for, for most of the season Rick Wise in a strange role a batter he used to be one of the best hitting pitchers in the National League. He hits a fly ball in the left field. He's had a career total of 15 lifetime homers, and he flies out to Foster. That's the first time he's been at bat in the last two years with a strange situation of one league using a designated hitter and the other league not, and yet playing the World Series in the old conditions. One down. The Red Sox pitchers, by the way, the last month took 20 minutes of batting practice every day when they thought, you know, they were, they were in there and or had a shot. 
Uh, until then, he never took any batting practice during the regular season. Cecil Cooper up. He hits a high fly in the shallow left. Out goes Concepcion. On comes Foster. And we have two down. Foster one hands everything. Here, one of these years, I like to see the American League rebel and say, hey, listen, World Series time. You play our rules in our park. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, uh, Tony, right now, you're not running baseball. <laughs> <laughs> two down, sure. nobody on. <laughs> Denny Doyle up, grounded out. One to nothing on Carlton Fisk home run. That's the Red Sox story as they're leading in the third. Gary Nolan looks sharp this inning. Comes in with a curveball inside. One to nothing. Nolan, born in Herlong, California. Lives in Oroville, California. Fouled away by the little scrapper. The Angels get a player for him, you know, after the season. And I think Harry Dalton is expecting a good one. The way Doyle's come through for the Red Sox. He wants either Fred Lynn or Jim Rice. <laughs> <laughs> he won't get him. Two balls and a strike to Denny Doyle. Two down, nobody on. And Doyle pops it up. Bench points out to the third baseman, Pete Rose. He squeezes it, three up, three down for the Red Sox. At the end of two and a half, Boston won, Cincinnati nothing. Packed and jammed Riverfront Stadium. We'll watch Cesar Geronimo lead off for Cincinnati in the last of the third. Then the pitcher, Gary Nolan, to the top of the order for Pete Rose. Geronimo is looking for his first hit in postseason competition. He went 0 for 10 against the Pirates, and he's 0 for 4 against the Red Sox pitching. Rick Wise has allowed one base runner so far. That was Foster who walked in the second. The Red Sox had a pair of hits in the second. Fist led off with a tremendous home run to left. And Petroselli single. That's been the hitting so far. We haven't seen any raw power in this series yet. Geronimo played as a pull hitter to right. Darrell Johnson. The Red Sox manager, and that's Eddie Popowski. He used to play with the house of David. When he was 19, couldn't grow a beard. The pitch. Bounding ball to Doyle. High hop to him on the artificial service. One away. Imagine uh, the New England fans who have never watched their club play too much in artificial service, even when they're on the road in the American League are amazing at these high hops. The second one, like a Wyoming jackrabbit, they get bigger and bigger with every hop. You can become a one-handed infielder on this because you get a true hop, although it's a faster hop. You don't have to get in front of every ball. All right, now you were an infielder. I want to ask you something in a minute. One down, nobody on. Gary Nolan up. Rick Wise's pitch is a strike. Nolan is a lifetime National League batter. Average of the batter, 147. How much does the change of grass to artificial surface bother you? Kurt, I had a chance to play uh, exhibition games the first three games in the Astrodome. We were coming north one year, and it is a grainy infield, and the ball picks up a top spin, and you think you're going to get in front of a ball, and the ball will scoot by you at times if you're not used to it. But you always get a true hop. The ball always bounds up to you, which you, means you can make a little bit better plays if you have to extend yourself. It never scoots. One out, nobody on. Two balls and a strike to Gary Nolan. One to nothing. Boston ahead. Last of the third inning. There's a ground ball fielded by Cecil Cooper at first base. Cooper was uh, playing toward the bag. Well, that one might have slipped into the right field corner. He figured Nolan to swing late. Here's Pete Rose up. Rose has a, quite a hobby. He has a videotape machine at home. And he came up to me uh, tonight, Marty and Tony, around the batting cage and said, well, I got the tape of the first two games of the World Series now. Play it for my grandchildren. He tapes all sorts of sports events, films. And he taped for his home the first two games of the World Series in Boston. He'll tape the entire series at home. Pitch of the strike, nothing a one. Rose grounded out the second base his first time.
He's consistent both sides. He hit 323 right-handed, 315 left-handed. Pounding ball to Doyle again. Look out, bad hop. Doyle got the handle, though. And the Reds go quietly down. One, two, three in the last of the third. At the end of three, it's one nothing Boston. First time Carl Yastrzemski's played in Riverfront Stadium since 1970. And he enjoyed himself. This is against the A's, a three-time American League batting champ. But back in 1970, Yastrzemski was the most valuable player of the All-Star game. He had four hits that night. Four hits and six times up. And he's leading off for the Red Sox in the fourth. Yastrzemski, Fisk, and Lynn. Carl's now made his permanent home in Boca Raton, Florida. Just moved down there. Hey, you get a little older, you want that heat and that sunshine. How are you looking years at, old. How are you looking at us? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> Pitches inside a ball to Yastrzemski. He grounded out his first time. The outfield playing him deep and toward right in center and right field. But they know he can slice to left, so they leave a gap in left center. Very quiet game so far. one nothing Boston. <laughs> Nolan's fastball is inside. 2 and nothing. This is really the first hitter he's been behind on like this. Two balls, no strikes to Yastrzemski. Fastball for a strike. 2-1. and one. Carlton Fisk on deck. Bounding ball to first baseman Perez. Tony again with an unassisted play, his third of the game. And now we've had five, six in a row go down before Gary Nolan. And here's the only man that scored tonight, Carlton Fisk, who pounded a home run to left field. In the second inning. That's been it. One to nothing. The Red Sox have had two hits. The Reds, no hits. The Red Sox have committed one error that hasn't hurt them so far. This bat through September for the Red Sox as Baltimore Challenge was probably the biggest bat in the lineup. He got a lot of big hits, and of course, his throwing arm helped a little bit too behind the plate. Well, they had the great rookie seasons from Rice and Lynn, but the last month, six weeks, this man was probably the most valuable player in the club. And what a help he is at Fenway Park. One ball, no strikes. Nolan behind. He didn't like that call. 2-0. Oh. He got behind Yastrzemski 2-0, oh, but got him out. A left-hander, Fred Lynn, is on deck. This is like a July night here. 81 degrees. That count runs to three and nothing on Fisk. He's trying to keep the ball away from him. Daryl Johnson pretty good at letting his men pick his pitch. Wouldn't surprise me a bit if Fisk gets his pitch and he might go after it. He did and he blasts it foul deep down the left field line. He was letting him hit three and nothing in Boston with a short fence but the wind coming in. And he gave Fisk the green light on 3-0. and Good. I've heard it said of Daryl Johnson that he's a conservative manager as we look at him. But we've seen him do some things in the championship series and, of course, in the World Series, keeping his base runners going, playing very aggressively on the base pass. Burleson going after a 3-0 and pitch. Johnson played in the 61 World Series for Cincinnati. Fisk is on with a walk. That's the first walk given up by Gary Nolan. Runner on first. Fisk runs well for a catcher. One out. Fred Lynn coming up. Lynn came up to USC as a pitcher. They converted him into an outfielder. Lynn, I noticed the last two games, Tony, looked like to me swinging too hard. He's been upper, uh, uppercutting the ball. He started pitching him inside, and he looked like he was trying to open up to get out in front to hit the ball. And then they started going away, and he's losing the ball or leaving the ball too soon instead of hitting the ball to left field. He starts him off with the inside pitch, 1-0. and oh. Lynn lives in Almonte, California with his father and wife. They uh, just told Perez, get off the bag a step or two. This fellow can line one down the right field line on you. And he hits it down the line, just foul. 
Foul by a footer, else that might have been extra bases in the corner. One ball, one strike to Freddie Lynn. Fisk going back to first with one out, and the Red Sox ahead, one nothing. Lynn, a very smart young hitter. He's learned a lot from Rod Dado, his former coach, but he said his father taught him more. And he's trying to take advantage of that hole between Morgan and Perez. That's why Tony's playing back. He might be the first player ever to win the Rookie of the Year and the Most Valuable Player of the Year award. There's the hole between Perez and Morgan. The count one and one. That's a curve that had him fooled. Beautiful slow curve by Gary Nolan. But I don't know if that's a curve or that changeup he throws that he turns over and drifts away. Let's watch the movement on the ball. It appears to be going away. It's one of the changeups that he turns over. It looks a little bit like a screwball. It does something. Good pitch. One ball, two strikes to Fred Lynn. Pitch again. He lines it in the right field for a base hit. Fisk is rounding second, heading for third. Griffey's throw is coming in. Cut off by Concepcion. Goes to first, and they get Lynn. Freddie Lynn slipped and fell down. He knew the cutoff was executed. He went around and thought if the ball was thrown over Concepcion's head, he would keep on going. And when he tried to stop on the artificial surface, his feet gave way. He fell down and couldn't get back. Well executed cutoff by the Reds. The Red Sox made some costly mistakes on the base of Sunday. Here it is, Kurt. Ken Griffey with a fine arm, and as Tony said, he almost overthrew Concepcion, and Lynn slipping as he rounded first base. A quick throw to Tony Perez, and even though the out call by first base umpire Dick Stello, the Boston first base coach, Johnny Pesky, really a little bit upset about the call. Red Sox made some base running mistakes Sunday. They would have had runners on first and third. One out. Now it's two down. Fisk at third and Petroselli up. Petroselli single his first time. So it's one run, three hits for the Red Sox. No runs, no hits for the Reds. We're in the top of the fourth inning. Curveballs hit up the middle. Morgan backhanding the ball. Makes the play. Great, great. Joe Morgan saved a run with that one. No run. One hit, one left. We'll have a rerun of that play. The score, one nothing Boston. He plants that right foot. A lot of times an infielder will slide going to his right on the dirt, but you can't do it on artificial surface. You've got to break yourself to a halt. He did it so well. He is as proud of that glove of his as anything in baseball, I think. Well, he saved a run with that stop up the middle and back a second. And the Reds come up on the last of the fourth, trailing one nothing with Griffey, Morgan, and Perez, the batters. Griffey grounded out the second his first time. Rick Wise has allowed just one base runner. He walked Foster in the second. Shea toward right for Griffey. The infield in. Step or two. Ready to unload in a hurry. There's Petroselli inside at third. Grossman in about three steps at short. And even Doyle's in against the left-handed batter a step or two. One and all to Griffey. Foul back. One and one. Marty Curdy mentioned earlier the number of infield hits that Ken Griffey got during the season, but he doesn't get a whole lot of bunts, does he? No, he doesn't, Tony. And he worked on it extensively in spring training and really did never seem to be able to come around effectively to bunt the baseball. He had seven bunts during the course of the season, but of course had the biggest infield hit he had all year long in the 10th inning against Pittsburgh. He's leading off last to the fourth. 1-1 one, one pitch. That was Wise's breaking delivery and it was low and inside to him. 2-1. and one. Pat Darcy is still warming up in the red bullpen and we're wondering about Gary Nolan. Two balls and a strike. There's a high fly in the left center. Lynn drawing a beat on it. One down. Fred Lynn's had three put outs so far. There's Darcy. He's been warming up every inning. Second, third, and fourth. Joe Morgan fly to center. Gets a hand from the Red fans for a sparkling play off the bat of Rico Petroselli. They don't have to tell Wise keep him off the bases here in this riverfront stadium. He flied out his first time. He's 
talking to Morgan about base stealing. Strike. He said, I could have stolen 80 or 85 bases this year. I'm not bragging. I'm just stating fact. And we got out in front. I didn't want to pound my body out. I wanted to save it for the postseason. But I didn't try to steal much late in the year. Fouls it back. He says, I don't know how Luke Brock does it, but he doesn't hit the dirt as much as I do going back to first. He says, I slide back a lot. And it starts to take something out of you. And he's right. Can you imagine just diving on that ground night after night, day after day, three or four times a game? Take a couple of years off your career. One out, nobody on. Two strikes to Joe Morgan. One to nothing. Red Sox ahead. Last to the fourth. Swung late. Why is it fast tonight? Darcy now is set down. And all is quiet at the Cincinnati bullpen. Hundred and thirty two walks for Morgan this year. Fourth of the league in batting at three twenty seven. Hmm. Throw him an overhand curveball and miss. One and two. One out, base is empty. A one two pitch. There's a drive hit in the deep center. Back goes Lynn. He's plenty of room. And the rookie grabs it for his fourth put out of the game. He's a marvel the way he can take his eye completely off the ball, as so many great outfields have been able to do. And he's got a chance to be a great outfielder, but he just takes his eye off completely, as you saw, picks the ball right back up, and there, well, some just can't do it and never learn. Yeah, he was, I said it before, and I'll say it again. You see some come along every now and then, and he was just born to play Major League Baseball. Two down, nobody on. Tony Perez fly to center his first time up. A high breaking pitch missing. Ball one. To join this late, Carlton Fisk smashed a home run to left field to lead off the second inning, and that's been it. One to nothing Red Sox. The count is two and nothing in favor of the batter. No hits so far by the Reds, but two down in the fourth. They've had one base runner, Foster, who walked. They're playing deep. Boy, look at that Burleson, deep for Perez. He's playing a shallow left field. There's a the strike. Look how deep Burleson's playing Perez, Tony. That'll show you what kind of confidence he has in his arm. He has an excellent throwing arm. He isn't as fast as Concepcion. He's quick. Two balls and a strike to Tony Perez. Two out, nobody on. Three and one count. Now Wise asks for a new ball. Johnny Bench on deck. They bunch Perez in the outfield. They really give him the left and right field foul lines. Bench watching Wise intently. Three one pitch. He walked him. That's the second walk given up by Wise. Here's Johnny Bench coming up. He grounded out to third in his first trip. Perez attempted only three steals this year. Successful what? Foster attempted only three, as we told you earlier, and he's already stolen a base in this game. Fisk has gone out to the mound now to have a conference with Wise, and we wonder with Wise getting a little wild high, if he's not reminding about that follow through to come on down through. What? Those are his pitching glasses now. <laughs> he had a better record on the road, winning 12, losing 5 this year, than he did at Fenway Park, where he won 7 and lost 7. Bench said to the umpire, I want to take a look at that ball. 1 to nothing. Boston ahead. Perez at first for the Reds, 2 down in the last of the fourth. They're back deep for Bench. He was drafted in the second round 
when he was a teenager, and Bernie Carbo when the Red Sox was picked ahead of him by the Reds. A strike. Oh, and one to bench. Bench is a great ambassador for the game. He's very personable, gracious to fans all over. There goes the runner. The throw down. And he's out. Safe. Perez steal. Tony Perez, only one steal this year. George Foster, two steals. They're both stolen tonight. No chance for Fess. He might have got him had he made a perfect control, but Cooper was playing back of him. And there he goes. And you haven't seen that too often, have you, Marty? I'll tell you, it's very, very surprising, Tony. You expect to see the likes of Griffey and Concepcion and Morgan and people like that, but certainly not Tony Perez. That was sort of a delayed steal. I think he caught this by surprise. And they're roaring here. They were the unlikely sight of Tony Perez stealing second. Two down. That wakes the Red fans up. And Ben, it's a drive deep to left. Going, going, gone. His concentration was broken by the surprise steal from Tony Perez, but that does not detract from Johnny Bench being the kind of player he is as we look at that dugout. He has been a man, Johnny Bench has, who has responded to pressure throughout his career. He's a man who creates excitement with a bat glove, and he even stole a few bases this year. That was the first hit for Cincinnati, and they have the lead, 2-1. to one. Johnny Bench's third World Series homer. He hit one in 71 and 72. And now in 75. And this all came after two out, nobody on. And Perez walked and stole second. And Bench hit that home run over the back wall off the facing of the bleachers. George Foster puts a foul ball in the seats for strike one. Foster walked his first time. And the Reds have two runs, one hit. The Red Sox, one run, three hit. Perez's steal seemed to wake everybody up here. They're sitting back quietly. Now they're still roaring. All right, we had that roaring Fenway Park crowd in Boston. For the Red Sox, it'll be just the opposite here in Cincinnati. No balls, two strikes to Foster. Petroselli guarding the third base line. That one's back out of play. Oh, and two count. The slogan we've seen around the city and the area, everywhere, and they have the banner hanging out in the bleachers off the third tier. When you're hot, your red's hot. Mm. All right now the Reds are leading two to one in the last of the fourth. The two strike pitch to George Foster. Try to tease him. One and two. As we told you earlier, home runs have hurt Rick Wise this year, and Bench's home run tagged him. The one two pitch. Two two count. Harris Concepcion hoping for a shot. Foster played straight away and deep. Two outs, bases empty. Ground ball to Petroselli. His throw, plenty of time. The Reds are gone, but they lead now with two runs, a hit. Nobody left at the end of four. Cincinnati two and Boston one. The preceding announcement was furnished to the public service by Major League Baseball. As we suspicion, there was more to that warming up down there every inning that was obvious 
Evidently, Gary Nolan's arm or shoulders tightened up on him, and Pat Darcy's come on now to pitch for the Reds in the fifth. He's facing Dwight Evans. First pitch to him is a ball. Well, Gary Nolan went four innings. He can get no decision here. He didn't pitch the five innings. They left the game ahead. He allowed one run, three hits. He walked one. He had no strikeouts. Darcy won 11 and lost five this year. 25 years old, born in Troy, Ohio. Lives in Tucson. A ground ball to Concepcion. A little flip throw, and Evans is out. One down in the fifth. Nolan was forced to leave the game because of stiffness in his neck. They've announced in the scoreboard. He must have told his manager about it in the second inning, and they, that's why they had Darcy ready. In case he uh, had kept stiffening up on him. Evidently, the spasm wouldn't release. Pitches in there for a strike to Burleson. Darcy had 21 starts, 22 starts in 27 games. He had a good year. Eastwick, Darcy, McEnany, they came up with three good young pitchers. Foul ball by Burleson. 0 oh and 2. They've tried to change Burleson. Look at the way he wraps that ball, bat around his neck. They said he could not hit that way. They tried to change him in the minor leagues. His manager, Daryl Johnson, did. But he seems to get the fat part of the bat on the ball and had a fine year this year, driving in key runs. Red Sox have one out, nobody on. There's a ground ball in the hole to left field. And Rick Burleson has his fifth hit of the series. He and Petroselli each have five hits now to lead the series in base hits. One out, Burleson at first, Rick Wise. The Red Sox pitcher coming up with the Reds ahead in the game, two to one, top of the fifth. Home runs accounting for the scoring. Home run by Fisk, nobody on for the Red Sox in the second. And Johnny Bench's home run with Perez aboard in the last of the fourth. And more action now in that Cincinnati bullpen. Clay Carroll has gone on down there. They're looking for the bunt. Earl Johnson has some options. There's Carroll. That pitch is in for a strike to him as he bluffed it. Pete Rose charging from third. Burleson at first. One down. They go to that bullpen in a hurry, the Reds. Bounding ball hits slowly. Cut off by Rose. Rose to second, gets the front man, Burleson. Rose actually was going backwards for that ball toward the shortstop. I think Rose considers that his best play. He says he has a lot of range to his left, and he proves it right here, cutting in front of Dave, that that ball had one more hop to Concepcion. It may have been a tough play at second base as Burleson got a good jump. Fine play by Pete. Rick Wise at first base. Two down and Cecil Cooper the batter. He is grounded out and flied out. He hit very well against the A's in the playoffs. He has only one out of ten in the World Series. Bench from behind the plate is really directing traffic, moving his outfielders fostered farther to the left field line or closer to it rather. High fastball to Cecil Cooper. Reds are leading two to one, top of the fifth. Wise a short lead at first. Now it's ball two. Perez is playing off the bag against the left-handed batter. Bella Perez and. Uh, Foster are going to try and steal. I want to wait and see what Concepcion and those fellas are going to do tonight. Are they going to run everybody? A couple of the unlikeliest reds. <laughs> you better believe they'll steal if Wise is in there if they get on base because he's considered to have a very slow move to first base and a home plate. Two balls and a strike to Cecil Cooper. Rick Wise at first, two down. Cooper hits a hot shot to Joe Morgan. He boots it. Picks it up and measures it off in time. That shows a poised ball player in that play. No runs, a hit, one left. We've gone halfway in the score, two to one, Cincinnati. Well, we've had a tight first half of this game. Home runs, bench, two-run homer, Fisk, a solo homer. It's two to one. 
The Reds are leading. It's my pleasure now to turn the play-by-play -play microphone over to Marty Brenneman, who is the voice of the Cincinnati Reds, not only here in Cincinnati, but how many stations throughout this area, Marty? Over 100, Kurt. you got a bigger network than we have. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again, everybody, as we go back to baseball action here in the third game of the 1975 World Series. And for the Boston Red Sox, or rather Cincinnati here in the bottom of the fifth inning, it'll be the... Bottom third of the batting order, Davy Concepcion, Cesar Geronimo, and pitcher Pat Darcy. Rick Wise, who pitched three innings, three plus innings of no hit baseball before giving up a two out walk in the last inning to Tony Perez, then the stolen base, and then the first Cincinnati hit, a Johnny Bench home run to left field to give the Reds their present two to one lead. As Wise concludes his warm ups to catcher Carlton Fisk, Dave Concepcion will. Stroll Platewood for his second shot at the Boston right-hander tonight. Davey is 0 for 1 at a fly ball to right field his first time up. 1 for 9 so far in this 1975 World Series. This young man has as his goal to be the best Venezuelan shortstop in the history of Major League Baseball. And mm. well, you're talking about <laughs> Tony Chico Carrasquel and Louis Aparicio mm. as forerunners. Talk about Aparicio, you're talking about something. First pitch on the inside part of the plate for a taken strike. Concepcion questioning plate umpire Larry Barnett about that pitch. And I closed out the season very, very strong. In fact, he had 340 the final month of the year and closed out the year with a nine game hitting streak. He hits one a ton back into left center field. Looking up is Jastrzemski and gone. A home run. Concepcion taking the grand tour as he takes Rick Wise downtown with a shot to left center field and while well, the Reds go out in front three to one. No matter what happens the rest of this ball game, win or lose, the headlines in the Venezuelan papers are going to be Concepcion and that's front page. That's what happened in the championship series when he homered against Pittsburgh. You mentioned those two names, Carascal and Aparicio, played against both, both Marty and Kurt. Concepcion has more all around ability than either of them. All round. For the bat and the glove you're talking about. Here's Cesar Geronimo now as Concepcion homers to begin the fifth inning for Cincinnati. And we have activity underway in the Boston Red Sox bullpen as a right-hander and a left-hander gets up to begin throwing. Geronimo bounced out to second his first time. He is ahead of the count at two balls and no strikes. Right-hander Reggie Cleveland, left-hander Jim Burton. So Daryl Johnson has seen Rick Wise give up a pair of long ones. One by Bench in the last inning with a man on and now by Concepcion. The only two Cincinnati base hits up to this point have been home runs. There's a call strike. Through four plus innings Wise has not struck out anybody. He has walked two. There's manager Daryl Johnson. Boston Red Sox he has seen his team now trailing three to one and that for Concepcion his first World Series home run. Pitch backs him off the plate as Wise comes high and tight at ball three three and one the count to Geronimo. On deck for Cincinnati is pitcher Pat Darcy. Wise needs a strike Geronimo a pitch away from a walk he swings he hits one back into deep right field. Going back is Devins, and it's out of here. Well, Kurt and Tony, Cincinnati putting on a long ball exhibition here as they have had three hits off Rick Wise and all of them home runs. And what great contributions the Latin American ballplayers have made to this club. Bench in a home run today, but it was Perez who stole second base. May have rattled Wise. Concepcion and Geronimo with home runs. Harold Johnson. Well, in Boston, Sparky Anderson during that rain time said, we've had a kitty car running around here, not the big red machine. And you can't win with a half run a game, but we're going to get going and swing that bat. You don't win 108 games and hit the ball like the Reds did in Boston. Uh, they have shown tonight how they can swing the bat well surprisingly Daryl Johnson has elected to leave Rick Wise in the ball game although he keeps the two pitchers warming up down in the Boston bullpen Jim Burton the left-hander Reggie Cleveland the right-hander 
So back to back home runs in the Cincinnati fifth inning by Davey Concepcion and Cesar Geronimo the seven and eight batters in the Reds lineup. Here's Darcy up for the first time. He takes a healthy cut and does not get Those it. Those are not ordinary seven and eight batters. And well, you know it, Marty. I'll agree with that, though. <laughs> Pat Darcy up for his first time. He came on in relief of Gary Nolan. And quickly behind to Rick Wise as pitcher faces pitcher two strikes. The crowd here at Riverfront Stadium, and they've got standing room only here tonight, still buzzing on the back-to-backers by the Cincinnati Reds. Very quiet, subdued crowd the first three plus innings. The Reds were not doing anything to speak of, but all of a sudden they come to life and lead four to one here. There's strike three call as Larry Barnett emphatically calls Pat Darcy out on strikes, and that's the first of the game for Rick Wise. Rick Wise is facing a dubious record. I know he doesn't want to tie. The record for the most home runs allowed by a pitcher in a World Series game is four. Charlie Root gave up four and 32 for the Cubs. Gene Thompson for the Reds in 39, and Dick Hughes with the Cards in 1967. Wise has allowed three in this game. Here's a man they refer to as Charlie Hustle. Pete Rose up for the third time, and he bluffs a bunt, and it's strike one to him as he turns around and comes back questioning Larry Barnett. The Red Sox have out hit the Reds four to three, but the Reds have had three homers. Two runs shot in the fourth by Perez and a uh, bench rather and back to back homers in the fifth inning by Concepcion and Geronimo. Strike two is called a Rose. Jim Burton and Reggie Cleveland continuing to heat up in the Boston Red Sox bullpen. The speckled Rick Wise looking into Carlton Fisk to get the sign. Rose goes the other way with a pitch, but hits a high, towering foul ball well back in the seats along the left field line. You well, know, Marty, every year we get new fans watching the World Series. I imagine some of them are saying, has this ever happened before? Two players, one right behind the other, hit home runs. This happened seven times before. Seven times in World Series competition, back-to-back -back home runs. Was, uh, maybe Tony was involved. Not in me, boy. <laughs> <laughs> The crowd getting on Rick Wise a little bit. Things not going at all well for him as he drops a throwback from Carlton Fisk. Throws it a hold and holding it two strikes. On deck for Cincinnati is right fielder Ken Griffey. One ball and two strikes on the waiting rows. That one is hit hard in the right center. Lynn racing back. Still on the run. He cannot play it. Rose coming to second as Dwight Evans picks up the ball, and Rose will go in standing up with a three base hit. Well, the extra base hits are ringing out off the bats of the Cincinnati Reds. And we saw what Sparky Anderson prophesied. He said if they play shallow like they did in Fenway, they're going to get hurt. The ball was hit very hard, a line drive, and watch. Charlie Hustle, as you just call him, Hustle from right from home plate. He hit the ball very well, Tony, and as you pointed out, you simply cannot play shallow in this ballpark. Freddie Lynn playing shallow and a deep blast to center by Pete Rose and actually a stand-up three-base hit for him. Well, Darrell Johnson is back to the Riverfront Stadium mound for the second time in the inning, and that means that is going to be all for Rick Wise. The left-hander Jim Burton is going to come on out of the Red Sox bullpen as he makes a slow walk from the visitors' bullpen here at Riverfront Stadium along the left field line. So there's a break in the action here at Cincinnati. The score, the Reds four, the Boston Red Sox one. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. New pitcher on the mound for the Boston Red Sox, and he's a left-hander, Tony. Jim Burton on in relief of Rick Wise. Pretty much of a power pitcher. He throws a lot of fastballs. His fastball will tail into the left-handed hitters. He gets it down low. It'll sink. There was his curveball, that delivery. Doesn't change speeds too often. Give you a good shot of this one as he's warming up to the curve. If he can keep it in that spot when a hitter steps up to the plate. Pretty good pitch. How about four hits, three homers, and a triple? Not a bad slugging percentage, Kurt. Oh. Jim Burton is a rookie, brought up during the season. 
He 26 years old on the 27th of October and a Michigan native now making his home in Rochester Michigan won a game lost a couple with a 289 ERA for the Red Sox in 29 games. Now the Boston infield comes in with the Reds having already struck for two runs on back to back home runs. Pete Rose at third base with a triple and there you see Ken Griffey stepping in to try and get Rose in with a fifth Cincinnati run. Left hander against left hander. And the fastball is up high. Pete Rose at third base. He hit one and hit it a ton to center field. Freddie Lynn really appeared to get an excellent jump on the ball, but the ball just going over his outstretched glove. Graham is getting a lot of signs down at third. Here's a 1 0 delivery, and that's high and outside. Two balls and no strikes on the Cincinnati right fielder, native of Denora, Pennsylvania, Ken Griffith. A lot of those signs, in fact, most of them are decoys. Kramis wants to put into the minds of the Red Sox that there's a possibility of a squeeze play. Burton pitching from the stretch. Griffey 0 for 2, a bouncing ball to second, a fly ball to center field. And he takes a strike at the letters from the left-handed Burton. 2 and 1. The Reds and the Red Sox splitting two at Fenway Park in Boston. Tion shutting out Cincinnati on five hits, six nothing Saturday. The Reds scoring two in the ninth inning Sunday. The score come from behind, three to two win, and now trying to go up two to one in the third game of this 1975 World Series. Rose taking his edge off the back at third, and Griffey takes it high and inside as he backpedals away from the plate. Joe Morgan going back to the dugout to talk with manager Sparky Anderson easy on deck hitter. I wonder if he was reading a little bit uh, giving a little mini scouting report to Morgan as to what Burton throws. Three balls and one strike. Boston in field in with one out two runs across and Pete Rose occupying the third base bag. Burton with a pitch and Griffey is on with a walk. Tony, you talk about Sparky Anderson maybe giving Joe Morgan a bit of information concerning Jim Burton. And these two clubs, of course, scouted each other well. Ray Shore for Cincinnati, uh, the Red Super Scout, Frank Malzone, Eddie Casco, both seeing Cincinnati and a whole lot of them during the last month or so of the season. Joe Morgan standing in in a run producing situation. He's had a couple of hits in nine times in this series, but 0 for 2 tonight with consecutive fly balls to center field. Uh, Petroselli playing about even with a bag and well off the line at third. Burleson and the second baseman Doyle a double play depth. Here's a throw to first base. Griffey not taking much of a lead to speak of. Burton not known to have a good move to first base and he's a little bit slow going to home. He's tall and lanky and many times it is a problem holding men on for a pitcher. Well, Jim Burton bound and determined to keep Griffey as close to the back as he possibly can. Ken Griffey will run. He had three stolen bases in the league championship series sweep over Pittsburgh. That's right. I was about to point out they had 10 out of 10 against the Pirates. 10 stolen bases and 10 attempts. I'll make it three in a row that he's gone that way. Four to one the score Cincinnati over Boston the Red Sox spotting him a run or rather the Reds spotting him a run of the second on a Carlton Fisk homer and the Reds have played long ball three times to jump out in front four one. Bird nine Griffey at first base to the plate to Morgan swing and a miss As Morgan went to hacking on the first pitch to the plate. The Red fans have had little to cheer about in World Series here in recent years. The Reds have lost five out of six games at Riverfront Stadium since the new ballpark was built. And tonight they're roaring every time they've got the shot. And they've had some. Burton after again throwing on to first base. Now looking down to Carlton Fisk as the Boston catcher hangs aside. Long look. One ball and one strike to Morgan. Marty, would you say, as we look at Pete Rose at third and Griffey at first, that Griffey has the best raw speed on this club? Oh, there's no question about it, Tony, and Joe Morgan will tell you that. 
uh, himself in a straightaway 100-yard dash. Joe, Ken Griffey will defeat anybody fairly easily on this club. Morgan out in front, two and one. He really hasn't learned the steal. He does most of it now on sheer speed, doesn't he? Joe Morgan constantly talked to him during the season of watching the opposing pitcher when you're in the dugout. Get involved in the game to that extent. That's the key to, to Joe Morgan's success. He's almost like a player coach in this team. He's amazing, Kurt. He has tremendous baseball knowledge, uh, easily conveys it. A lot of people think he'd be a great manager one day. Here's a fly ball hit well to right field. That ball is going to be a foul ball. Well, Dwight Evans could do nothing but watch that ball and hope that it stayed foul, which it did. Joe Morgan, uh, Sparky was telling me yesterday, he does not like men running off first base on him. He does with two strikes on a hitter. He gives him the okay. But he says it distracts his concentration. Burton back of the mound rubbing up the baseball and... Here we'll see that last line drive foul and see what the base runners do on this. Watch Rose with one out. He'll go back immediately to tag up in case the ball is caught. Griffey going about halfway, seeing whether it was going to be fair or not. Two and two, the count on Morgan. And now Burton has gone full to him. And that pitch right there is a pretty good example of the tremendous discipline this man has at the plate, although it was interesting to note when Sparky Anderson announced yesterday that he was moving Morgan back into the number three position that he'd be a little bit more reckless in that spot than he, than he would be in the number two position and that he would go after pitches that normally he might not hit going at number two. An RBI spot, not a walk spot. Burton, before delivering the payoff pitch, again throws on to Cooper at first base. Good close-up shot of the young rookie left-hander Jim Burton for Boston. Morgan with a fly ball into straightaway center field. Now Rose tagging at third. Here's Lynn coming in to make the catch. Here's a throw to the plate, and it will not be in time. The Reds go out in front five to one. Sacrifice fly for Joe Morgan as he picks up his first RBI in the 1975 World Series. The Reds now lead by four runs. And here's Tony Perez, who really seemed to provide the momentum for the Reds back in the last inning after drawing a two-out walk, surprisingly stealing second base and scoring ahead of Johnny Bench on Bench's home run. Now's the time to watch Ken Griffey with two outs. He wants to get in scoring position. Absolutely, Tony. You may well see him running. There he goes. High pitch. Down to second. No. The Reds are running and running at will right now. The Boston Red Sox. And with that stolen base. It's just no contest for Carlton Fizz. Griffey with a great jump and great speed. Carlton has no chance at all. This is their third stolen base. Perez, Foster, and now Griffey. Three stolen bases already, and Daryl Johnson's gone out to the mound. Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but that did not appear to be a good pitch for Fist to throw on. It looked like an off-speed pitch. Looked like a hard-breaking ball. It's up in the strike zone, which is what a catcher prefers. It wasn't a good, no matter what he threw in that situation, it was just a great speed and a great jump by Griffey. He wasn't going to get thrown out. Well, the Red Sox are changing pitchers for the second time in the inning, so there's a break in the action here at Cincinnati with a score. Reds 5, Boston 1. Remember the World Series Game 4 tomorrow night. Louis Tion for the Red Sox, Don Gullett for the Reds. Preceded by the baseball world of Joe Garagiola, featuring Foster Brooks and a different kind of baseball story. On NBC Sports, number one in live coverage of major sports events all year round. And the Reds, with two in the fourth, three in the fifth, running wild now on the bases. Bring a right-hander in Cleveland to face Tony Perez. Reggie Cleveland inheriting a count from the departed Jim Burton, one and nothing, the pitch that Ken Griffey stole second base on. 13 game winner for the Red Sox during the 1975 regular season. 
Two balls and no strikes to Perez. Cleveland might have been the most consistent pitcher on the Red Sox staff. From the end of July on through the season, he was about 10 wins, three losses. And Lott thought he would start the second game in Fenway Park because of his good championship series performance. Cleveland checking Griffey at second. Perez with a swing at a miss. It's two balls and one strike. Well, the reason they didn't was because of what we saw here today or tonight. And that is Wise, a high ball pitcher. They wanted a ground ball pitcher at Fenway. They wanted Wise to pitch in a bigger ballpark. Wise started the second playoff game against the Oakland A's. Did not get a decision. He's come back to get the count even against Perez at two and two. 13 wins, nine losses for the Red Sox with a 443 earned run average. He made 31 appearances with 20 starts. Reds today getting the kind of pitchers they seem to thrive on hard ballers, hard fastball, hard sliders, not much off speed stuff. They wait for that fastball, mm -hmm. don't they? They sure do. Okay, Cleveland cranking it up again as he checks second. Perez fouls it off to the right. But you know, they, they talk about the Reds being a fastball hitting team. Any good hitting team has to be a good fastball hitting team. I remember those great Yankee teams you played on, Tony. You fellas love that fastball. Any good hitting team does. We love Wilhelm's knuckleball. There's Ben. <laughs> There's Ben. <laughs> you ever score off him? <laughs> it's a no hitter against us. <laughs> well, this Reds ball club led the majors in run production in 1975, and the Boston Red Sox were second. Full count to Tony Perez. Well, the Reds felt, Tony, they had an advantage possibly in the sense that Rick Wise and Reggie Cleveland, both former National League pitchers, and uh, most of the Reds hitters remember them from their years into this league. There's Kenny Griffey leading at second base. Here, two down in the inning. The Reds have struck for a trio and lead Boston 5-1 to one as we play baseball in the fifth inning. That's all for Tony Perez, and that's all for Cincinnati. A big inning, three runs across for the Reds here in the fifth. And at the end of five complete. Denny Doyle will open up the Boston Red Sox sixth inning. And the Red Sox, well, they're down by four runs. In this, the third game of the World Series and the first of three straight nights of World Series action here in Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium. Pat Darcy misses with a first pitch down low. And so far, the Red Sox first three batters in the lineup have not reached base. That's right, Kurt. Cooper 0 for 3, Doyle 0 for 2 as he pops it foul. Third base side, Rose and Concepcion, and Pete Rose squeezes it for the out. It has been tough all year long, and it will be tough again today for a team to come from behind with that great bullpen that Cincinnati has. And, of course, Sparky uses it. He doesn't waste any time. None whatsoever. And this is the first uh, World Series appearance, of course, for right-hander Pat Darcy. Reds were almost invincible in this ballpark, winning 64 and losing only 17. That's not counting the wins that they had here against the Pittsburgh Pirates two straight in the National League Championship Series. Two balls and no strikes. A count on the left fielder, Carl Yastrzemski. He's 0 for 2 and has hit ground balls both times, once to Morgan and once to Tony Perez. Yastrzemski now 2 for 9 in the World Series. Waiting Pat Darcy out as he comes with a fastball that goes to 3-0. and oh. On deck for the Boston Red Sox, catcher Carlton Fisk, who has accounted for the only Red Sox run with that homer back in the second. Fastball over on the 3-0 pitch. Darcy has not worked in a game since the 27th of September and then only two-thirds of an inning in relief. Yaz is on with a one-out walk. That ought to be enough for Sparky to get somebody going. Well, I'll tell you, Tony and Kurt. You're right. He, you're right. Absolutely <laughs> right. Warm-up action. Yes, Stremski gets a walk. Clay Carroll goes down to the Reds' bullpen to begin throwing for what will be the second time tonight. I don't blame him for the job that he got from his two veterans, Carroll and Barbone, and the two kids, Eastwick and McEnany. Fisk has been on both times. The home run in the second, then he drew a walk from Gary Nolan in the fourth inning. The Reds infield looks for the ground ball with one out and one on. And Darcy having trouble finding the strike zone. Cincinnati five, Boston one. Each club has had four hits, but all four for Cincinnati have been extra base hits, three homers and a triple. Strike to it. 
You look at this record of the Cincinnati team, 20 game winning margin, 108 wins, their fantastic home record, yet they went 45 games in a row without a complete game. Sparky felt like that was a misleading figure, Kurt, because of the fact that he had such a deep, deep bullpen. Here's a check swing foul ball. Sparky Anderson and his philosophy in terms of pitching, he feels if he gets a good effort out of his starting pitcher for seven innings, if he can help it, he's not going to let him lose the ball game. It's pretty much the modern thinking all around now. And there go the batting averages because it <laughs> knocked off a few points with specialists, relief specialists, defensive specialists. Can't win without a good relief. Uh, not man, but a couple or three. It's been the salvation for the Cincinnati club, I'll tell you. Darcy ahead of the hitter. Misses low and inside to Fisk. Two and two now. In the inning, Doyle has popped out foul ground to Pete Rose, and Yastrzemski has drawn a walk. Now a timeout call by the right field foul line umpire, Nick Colosi. The ball apparently got loose out of the Cincinnati bullpen. Darcy taking his time. Perez playing off the bag and behind the runner at first, and now it's down in the dirt. It's a full count. So Pat Darcy rapidly pitching himself into a problematical situation in the sixth inning. And again, as we mentioned, he's not worked since the 27th of September, and certainly that could have something to do with his possible control problems. Another walk as he's given up back to backers to Yastrzemski and Fiss. Marty, is Johnny Ben still cutting the middle inside of his glove up when he gets the glove? Have you noticed that he does that? I don't think he's doing it anymore, Tony. I know he used to do it, but I don't believe he's doing it anymore. I don't know what the reasoning behind it was. A little bit looser, uh, able to bend it more because he has a one handed catcher, easier for him to break in. Sparky Anderson a little bit concerned right now in the Cincinnati dugout as Darcy has put a couple of runners on the easy way walks to Yastrzemski and to Fisk. Here's Freddie Lynn and his ball one to him. You know, he made a great statement tonight. He, he said in Boston he'd never been treated as nice by an organization as the Red Sox. Of course I want to win the World Series. But we also want a great World Series. Ran the pitch in on him a call strike. This is our showcase. Told me the same thing earlier tonight. Kurt signing balls down in the Reds dressing room. He said, We want to win this series, but we want to promote baseball. Right under Jim Willoughby is going down to begin throwing for Boston as Lynn Ooh. fouls the pitch back to the netting, and he's down to Darcy at one and two. And he had the pitch he wanted too, right in his wheelhouse. Little up and in. There's Willoughby. Quite a story for the Red Sox. Had a great streak helping them toward their Eastern Division Championship. Came up from Tulsa. Recommendation of Kenny Boyer. Runners leading at first and second base with one out. Lynn a foul strike off to the left and out of here. Kurt, I don't know that there's been a rookie for many, many years that has so dominated a league as Fred Lynn, of course, Jim Rice also. Rice came strong the last two months. That one, a bouncer that gets by Johnny Bench, and both runners will advance. He scored a wild pitch. No chance. Johnny got down, tried to keep it in front, but the ball bounced way out in front. And when you get a breaking ball, it takes a little bit of spin and sometimes bounces away. Well, a big meeting on the mound right now. Pat Darcy will join there by Joe Morgan and shortstop Davey Concepcion as they talk it over. This has been all Darcy's doing with the two walks and now a wild pitch. Red Sox trailing by four runs, but a base hit here from Freddie Lynn could get him to within striking distance again. Sparky Anderson talking with his pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Clay Carroll continuing to heat in the Reds' pen. Well, he just did get a piece of the ball to stay alive. Looks like he's got a good natural sinker. That ball went down a lot. He does, Tony. This fastball simply explodes at home plate. When he's throwing the good hard stuff, he... He's got a good moving fastball. I feel giving Lynn quite a bit of room in left center field. He went after a high pitch and hits it very high into left center. 
Foster, Geronimo, it's going to be Foster. Here's a tag at third. Here's a throw to the plate. And it'll not be in time. And the Red Sox are on the board for the second time tonight. I was surprised that Foster took it. There was plenty of time for Geronimo, who has the superior throwing arm, to come over and get in position. But Foster apparently waved him off. They have rated the two best throwing arms in this series, Geronimo and Evans. Tony, the point you just made, I would imagine, if you could look inside the head of Sparky Anderson, he's not too pleased with the fact that Foster caught that ball in left field for the very reason that you pointed out. I don't think Joe Morgan was either. He was looking out there from behind the pitching mound after it happened. Fisk remaining at second base. Here's Petroselli, and again, Darcy throws one into the dirt. Here's just another one of the things Bench does so well is this and he blocks in the dirt. We've seen him scoop up a ball in a key situation in game number two, first and third, and nobody out, and a throw from Concepcion. Darcy continuing to pitch from behind the Boston hitters is two balls and no strikes to Petroselli. How about that play made on the bunt at Fenway Park? Looked like a big cat out there that time. Two down in the inning, a run home for Boston, five to two, and there's a call strike. Not Darcy, the man who stands to gain the win in this game, and that Gary Nolan, the starter, went only four innings. Three balls and a strike as he misses high with a fastball. Both bullpens are busy here in the Boston sixth inning. We got a look at third base coach Don Zimmer shouting out to the runner at second Fisk. Here's a bouncing ball charging Concepcion. And that's all for the Red Sox in the sixth inning. They get a run, no hits, a man left on. After five and a half innings of play in Cincinnati, it's the Reds five and the Red Sox two. Well, a lovely young lady right down there, as you see, and that's Mrs. Vicki Chesser Bench. Young South Carolina lady married to the Reds catcher Johnny Bench. That's her mom to her left and her dad to her right as they watch the action here. And she's got to be a very happy young lady now and that her husband had a fourth inning home run that put the Reds out in front. And it's Johnny Bench leading off the bottom of the sixth inning for Cincinnati. That home run for Bench is third hit in the series. He's now gone three for ten and facing the right hander for the first time in the game. Reggie Cleveland the third Boston pitcher to be used by Darrell Johnson tonight starts Bench out with a breaking pitch. He checked his swing in time. Five runs on four hits for Cincinnati. They've certainly made the most of their base hits. And swings and misses at a pitch out away from him. Reggie Cleveland has a very important job now. Any middleman coming in with his team behind, he has to check that other club and allow nothing more and enable his club to try and creep back into the ball game. That's well a foul ball off the very tip end of the bat. So he's behind at Cleveland. One ball and two strikes as Johnny Bench leads off the six with George Foster on deck. Again, Rick Burleson playing extremely deep. Johnny Bench, a dead pull hitter. Count even at 2-2. He had one home run during the regular season the other way, and I'll tell you, it was a real shocker to the fans here at Riverfront Stadium. Saw Tony and I saw him hit one here against Pittsburgh in the fifth game in 72 to the opposite field. Now Cleveland has chalked up his second strikeout. He fanned Perez to end the fifth and now KO's Johnny Bench to begin the sixth inning. One away and here's George Foster. He walked his first time up and then bounced out to Petroselli at third in the fourth inning. Mentioned earlier the fact that the back to back Reds home runs in the fifth inning was the seventh time in World Series history that's been pulled off. But an interesting side note, it's a first ever by a National League club. Six time the American Leaguers have hit back to backers. First time by the National League. Here's a very high fly ball. Tracking it, the veteran Carl Yastrzemski. And they're two down quickly. <laughs> David Concepcion now with two away and the base is empty for Cincinnati. 
getting an especially big hand by the Reds crowds at Riverfront. He had a home run leading off the fifth. Don Zimmer was talking to Bench before the ball game about the great shortstops in the National League. They were comparing them. Boa, Metzger, Concepcion. And it seemed to see that the Concepcion came out on top all round. Here's a call strike to him. Tony, as you well know, being a former shortstop, he's got tremendous range. He's got a fine arm. He's a heady type of ball player. He knows the hitters very well in this league. And you talk to Sparky Anderson, and he said, hey, this kid hasn't reached his prime yet. He's going to get better. Check swing foul. Reggie Cleveland throwing strikes. He's jumped out in front two strikes on Dave Concepcion. I'll tell you one thing about Sparky. John Ralston, the Dale Carnegie of pro <laughs> football. Sparky is Mr. Positive of baseball. I guess you have the kind of club he has. You can afford to be that way. Yes, sir. Seems to be a bit more relaxed right now. That's his favorite seat. When the Reds are hitting, he sits next to Ted Klazuski. And when the Reds are in the field, he moves over near his pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Ground ball the other way, scooped up by Cooper. He taps a bag, and the Reds are meekly out one, two, three in their half of the sixth inning here. Three up, three down at the end of six. Reds over the Red Sox, five to two. Well, we have World Series game number seven. We'll have a baseball football doubleheader this coming Sunday. Coverage beginning at 12.30 with a baseball world of Joe Garagiola. Followed by the World Series Game 7 from Boston. And then at 4 o'clock by three regional NFL football games. The highlight game of the day would be Oakland right here against the Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati. The World Series is completed. We'd have an NFL doubleheader. We'll tell you more about it right now again. Marty Brenneman. Thank you, Kurt. Here's Dwight Evans leading off the 7th for Boston. And the first pitch misses from Pat Darcy. And while well, we've got activity in both bullpens... For the Boston Red Sox, that's right-hander Jim Willoughby throwing. Swung on, a bouncing ball up the middle. Concepcion cannot get it. That is hit number five for the Boston Red Sox. Evans quickly coming back into first base as the throw goes that way. Here's Evans going nicely with the pitch. Concepcion was playing him a little bit up the middle. Another one of those, we've repeated it before, an artificial surface, scoots right on by him. That'll bring up Rick Burleson and Sparky Anderson on his way to the mound. And before he ever reaches a first base foul line, he signals that he wants a right-hander, Clay Carroll. So Clay Carroll will be coming on in a saving situation as Darcy heads back toward the Cincinnati dugout. Well, Rick Burleson was scheduled to bat for the Red Sox. He will be hitting. He goes back to the Boston dugout to confer with Carlton Fisk as Clay Carroll now reaches a Riverfront Stadium mound. Bernie Carbo has moved to the on-deck circle. He's going to be the pinch hitter for the pitcher, Reggie Cleveland. And, well, we're witnessing a game here tonight where we're seeing both managers go to their bullpens and go to them frequently. The Red Sox have used Wise, Burton, and Cleveland. We'll be seeing another new Boston pitcher when the Reds bat in the seventh. And now right-hander Clay Carroll known as a hawk here in Cincinnati, becomes the third pitcher for the men of Sparky Anderson. Captain Hook's gone to work. That's what he's known around here as. We look at Clay Carroll from all angles. He's pretty much of a power pitcher. He has served mostly in relief up here in Cincinnati, although he has been a starter in some trouble times. Good sinking fastball, hard slider. He can come in and throw strikes, get you the ground balls and occasionally strike out. Here now in slow motion, Clay Carroll from Four Angles, Harry Coyle, our director who's been in almost every World Series, working hard to get all these different angles for you. Since 193. Oh, 1903. <laughs> did they televise back then? If they did, Harry was here. <laughs> Clay Carroll ready to go to work now on Rick Burleson, and he gets the first pitch over for a taken strike. This is second game of. This 1975 World Series, he did not record an out and coming on in relief of Don Gullett in game one Saturday at Fenway Park. And his 11th appearance lifetime in series competition. 
He's 0-2 with Burleson, and again, Bernie Carbo in the on-deck circle to bat for pitcher Reggie Cleveland. And uh, with those left-handers coming up, Carbo followed by Cooper, Doyle, and Yastrzemski, the Reds have McEnany, their left-handed reliever, warming up. Evans leading at first base, nobody out. Trying to get him to go after a breaking ball out away from him, but Burleson not having any of it. There's McEnany, young man from Springfield, Ohio, who just a few days ago became a father for the first time. The Red Sox try to battle back. They're down by three big ones in the seventh. Swung on. That could be two. Morgan, Concepcion, Perez. And that is a highly underrated part of this total team the Cincinnati Reds have. Morgan and Concepcion. You've said it before, but they just might be the best all around ever to play the game around second base and that takes in a lot of territory. They talk about the Reds power. They set a major league record this year. They played 15 consecutive games without making an error. They had the fewest errors in their league. So they do it both ways. What you would have to do in any sport to win. Here's Bernie Carbo batting for Reggie Cleveland and this is somewhat of a homecoming of sorts and he hits one well back into left field. Foster looking and it's out of here. That's a typical Carbo home run to the opposite field. He thought it was a ground rule double. <laughs> he thought it bounced, did he? Come on, Bernie. He hit his we home runs at Crosley yeah. Field when he first came out. We know you're excited. You know, he came out yesterday at the workout and stirred up a little controversy. He thought that he should be playing back here <laughs> in Cincinnati, that Yastrzemski should go back to first base. He should be in left field. Yeah, has got a little bit irritated, we understand, with it. There's Foster going back. Marty Brenneman pointed out that yellow line as he went around the park early in the game. Just barely made it. He really has power to the opposite field for a left-hander. Here comes Sparky Anderson again. He's wearing on a path from the dugout to the mound, and he's going to bring on the left-hander McEnany, apparently, to pitch to the left-handed batting Cecil Cooper. Kurt, you know, it's amazing. We had two games in Boston. They talked about the green monster. No home runs, and now look what's happened here tonight. Well, that wind... I, I guess I talked a lot, a lot about it over the weekend, but I, I've seen so many times with that east wind, and that's where Johnny Bench may, we may look back. We don't know what's going to happen, and here are the Red Sox getting back into this one. So Johnny Bench showed me something Sunday. With that wind blowing in against him, he went to the opposite field instead of trying to hit the wall. That was smart hitting. We have a break in the action, another pitching change for the Reds, and the score right now is Cincinnati 5 and Boston 3. Well, there you got to look at 23-year-old Will McEnany, 5-2 and two on the year for Cincinnati, and he led this club in appearances coming out of the Reds' bullpen a total of 70 times. He'll be working to the left-handed batting Cooper with two down. The pitch to him swung on, a jam job that he bloops into shallow left center, and that's the inning. For the Boston Red Sox in the seventh inning, they get a run on a couple of hits, the home run by Bernie Carbo. And at the end of six and a half, it's a Reds five and the Red Sox three. Another pitcher on for the Boston Red Sox as the Reds come calling in the seventh inning, and it's going to be right-hander Jim Willoughby. Don't Willoughby spent mentioned. some time in the National League. He had a great streak where in about 12 or 14 appearances in relief, he figured in a lot of big decisions, something like 12, 12 of them saves or wins. But Daryl Johnson called... Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Willoughby was pitching, talked to an old friend, Ken Boyer, said, if you got somebody down there who can help us, you owe us a player from a deal they had made. And Boyer said, well, we've got a guy here who's pitched some games starting, has gotten 20 ground ball outs. Daryl Johnson said, that's what I need, a man who can come in, get a right-handed hitter out and get me the double play. And he sent Jim Willoughby. He's a sinker baller. He was pitching overhand at one time, and I found out when he dropped down, he's much more effective. His, he'll have a natural sinker ball when he throws that ball sidearm. He's tough on right-handers. Going to be facing eight, nine, and one in the Cincinnati half of the seventh inning. Geronimo, who had the back end of those back-to-back -back home runs for the Reds in the fifth inning. Concepcion let it off with a home run to left center, and then Geronimo played long ball to right. Willoughby becomes pitcher number four for Boston. Geronimo takes strike one. 
Red Sox not out of this game by a long shot. They trail five to one at one point. They have scored a couple of runs. We have witnessed a total of five home runs in this game. Three by Cincinnati and two by Boston. There's McEnany on deck. Nobody throwing in the Reds bullpen, which would indicate that McEnany will hit for himself. Reggie Cleveland did an outstanding job retiring four batters in a row before he faced. There's a fly ball hit well to center field, but that, of course, the deepest part of the park, and Lynn has no trouble with it. Kurt, you saw Joe DiMaggio, Dominic DiMaggio. They always talk about Joe gliding back. We just saw Freddie Lynn glide back. What kind of comparison is there? Well, I saw Joe DiMaggio, you know, in the twilight of his career when he was 32, 33 years old. You can see that fluid grace still there, but not the way it was when he was a young player. Lynn is deceptive like Joe, though. He sort of glides after the ball, long strides. Hackett, he takes the first pitch away from him, and Boston pitching has now retired a total of six batters in a row. Griffey reaching on a walk in the fifth inning, and he's been the last Cincinnati base runner. One ball and one strike. Let me tell you, the little brother wasn't bad out there in mm. center field, a little professor. He, he got everything and threw well. They all three are outstanding. There's a chopper over the mound. That's going to be played by Doyle back in second. And the ball is mishandled by Cooper. It appeared to be a throw down in the dirt from Denny Doyle, and Cooper could not make the pickup. And they're trying to win the third World Series game. They go to work early here, Kurt. They sure do. Comes with a fastball, and now McEnany had Lynn down 0 and 2. It's now two balls and two strikes as Will requests and gets a new baseball. On deck for the Boston Red Sox, third baseman Rico Petroselli. He'll be followed by the right fielder Dwight Evans. Now the 2-2 pitch. Spike three is called. That was a drop. Very sharp breaking curveball. That gets Lynn. He had no chance on that. Perfect spot. Watch it. He's just overmatched on that pitch. You can see him start pulling out, pulling away, looking for something inside. Great pitch. McEnany and Eastwood remind me a lot of Mossy and Narleski in the 50s when they came up with Cleveland. Here's a base hit to center field by Rico Petroselli, who continues to swing a very, very potent bat for the Red Sox in this series. Oh, we got the tying run coming up with the left hander to face the right hander comes Sparky. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. Sparky Anderson a busy man going from dugout to pitcher's mound tonight is once again sending down the call and this time it's going to be right hander Raleigh Eastwood. McEnany giving up a one out single to center by Rico Petroselli and as Tony mentioned that brings a tie and run to the plate. Batter will be Dwight Evans when we get back to the action. Oh, we'd like to pass along our thanks tonight to statistician Alan Roth our production stage manager Jim O'Gorman and our field supervisor Huey McDermott. Sparky Anderson trying to get a very, very emphatic point across to Raleigh Eastwick. And this young man, having won a game already, the Sunday game at Fenway, now comes on to try and save this one. And, well, rightly so, as far as the Reds are concerned, because as Kurt and Tony pointed out earlier tonight, it has been McEnany and it has been this young man from Haddonfield, New Jersey, who have proven to be the salvation for this Reds bullpen. And in the Red Sox dugout are mostly right-handed uh, batters to pinch hit. Doug Griffin, Bob Heiss. They do have one left-hander, Rick Miller, Juan Benicas. Sparky Anderson doesn't miss many chicks. As he talked to Eastwick after he left the mound, he looked over to Tony Perez, say, play behind the runner at first. He looked out to his outfield and motioned them to play a little deeper to prevent an extra base hit to keep that tying run out of scoring position. Eastwick, I think, primarily a power pitcher, slider, and fastball. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, World Series game number four from Cincinnati. El Tiante against the brilliant young left-hander, Don Gullett, preceded by the baseball world of Joe Garagiola. Joe show tomorrow night, Foster Brooks, and a different kind of baseball story. Joe's told me about it, and it's going to be some show. We've got a show right now here in the ninth now. 
That we do. Eastwick is all set to go to work to Evans. Joe Morgan coming quickly in from second base to have a word with him. I forgot about the switch hitter, Blackwell, in the dugout of the Red Sox. Petroselli at first. The man at the plate is Dwight Evans, and he represents the tying run. It's five to three Reds. As Boston now has out hit Cincinnati, seven to five, and Pedro Bourbon, a right-hander, picks up where Eastwick left off. Evans one for three. Pitch. That's low a ball. There's Bourbon. Mark has got a pitcher for every batter. <laughs> I'll tell you, he's used just about everybody with the exception of Bourbon, Kurt. Fred Norman expected to be utilized as a reliever in the series, but he has not thrown tonight. Here's a fly ball hit into left field. Foster back on the warning track, and he will not get it. It's a home run in a tie ball game. Raleigh Eastwick has just given up a game-tying ninth-inning home run to Dwight Evans. As the Red Sox dugout erupts, they have tied it up at 5 all. And we've just had an all-time World Series record tied. Six home runs, three by each team tonight. The Red Sox made quite a comeback. Cleveland and Willoughby kept them in the ballgame with their relief pitching. They were trailing 5-1, to one, and now they've tied it. Evans wasn't sure. He ran hard all the way to first base. It was hit so high, and after he hit the bag, what a jump from jubilation he gave. Now it's Rick Burleson at the plate. One hit and three times up. A ball to him. Boston dugout just now settling down as they welcomed Evans in. One ball and one strike as Eastwick comes with fire to the Boston shortstop. That was a clutch home run right there, folks. Mm. Foster still thought he had a chance as we look at Dwight Evans' home run again. There he gives up. A little despair as he presses that wall. Two runs across for the Red Sox to tie it up. Here's a fly ball into shallow center. Morgan back. He cannot get it. Morgan trying to play it all the way, ranging back into shallow center field, but Burleson dumps it in. And now the Red Sox have the go-ahead run on. And the pitcher, Jim Willoughby, getting a word as he heads toward the plate from third base coach Don Zimmer. He's probably telling Willoughby if the bunt is on which direction to bunt it, Rose will be charging hard at third. It's difficult to bunt an artificial service because the ball gets to the infielder so fast. The place you'd like to go is to the first baseman, Perez, because he's got the hold of the runner, Burleson, on. Now Pete Rose. Playing in shallow at third base as Willoughby is up in a bunt situation. Tony Perez charging through that first base, but not in time as Morgan snuck in behind the runner, and they almost had him. What a snap throw by a bench. He the, rifled that one. The set play, a time play. Joe Morgan started going right off the bat. Here he comes, right behind the runner, Burleson. Burleson, a very alert base runner. A lot of guys might have gotten picked off in that. The Red Sox getting a two-run homer from Evans to tie it up and now trying to get the go-ahead run around. Burleson at first base, one out. The 1-0 -oh to Willoughby, but at first base side, it's a good one. Tony Perez will have to throw on to Morgan covering for the out and a sacrifice bunt as Willoughby does his job. Look at Pete Rose on that last bunt. By the time the bat is on the ball, he's 10 feet away from Willoughby, the pitcher. Willoughby with an exceptional bunt on this artificial surface. Now look at look at Johnny say knock it down. You can see him directing traffic back at home plate. Raleigh Eastwick and the Reds involved in a pressure cooker situation as Roger Moret goes back to begin throwing in the Red Sox bullpen. 5-5 five, five tie. Go ahead run at second base in the ninth inning with two out and Cooper with a pop up back of the plate but Bench will not have a play on it. No difference, a Red Sox fan, a Reds fan. This has been some kind of ball game. Mm. Boston led one nothing. The Reds went out in front five to one, and boy, credit the Red Sox. They have battled back. Low and inside, one ball and a strike. Well, the Reds have come back. I think what over 40 times this year to win games. The Red Sox have done the same thing. You don't win a league championship without doing that. Eastwick trying to get the third out. Checks Burleson at second. Cooper with a foul back. 
Cooper, one of four 300 hitters for the Red Sox this season. He batted 311. There is Daryl Johnson. Right alongside is catcher Carlton Fisk as they watch the action. Barrett has been joined in the Red Sox bullpen by a right-hander, Dick Drago. See Drago on the left, Moret on the right. Another foul ball as Eastwick continues to throw strikes and Cooper fouls him away. Holding count, a ball and two strikes. Some pretty good arms in the outfield for Burleson to challenge off second base on the event of a base hit to the infield. Geronimo leading the pack, maybe in all of baseball with that strong, accurate throwing arm. Another check swing foul ball by Cooper. He's headless and four times up tonight, has grounded out twice, has popped to the infield and hit a fly ball to left. Start thinking about the Cincinnati ninth inning. They're going to have Bench, Foster, and Concepcion coming to the plate. 5-5 five, five lockup. One and two pitch. Swung on. Fly ball. Shallow center. Geronimo. He's got it. The side retired. A ninth inning that ties it up for the Red Sox. Two runs on three hits with a man left on. We go to the bottom of the ninth. Reds five. Boston five. Well, we're into sudden death. The bottom of the ninth inning in a 5-5 five five ball game. And Jim Willoughby, who has pitched outstanding ball in relief for Boston. In fact, the Reds over the last three innings have had only one hit, and that came from, of all people, Will McEnany, an infield hit off of Willoughby in the seventh inning. The Red Sox have Drago, a right-hander, a fastball pitcher. Moret has an outstanding arm. He's a left-hander. And here's Johnny Bench to lead it off. There you see in the upper right hand corner of your screen Johnny's wife Vicky along with her parents as Johnny leads off the ninth inning he's had one of the three Cincinnati home runs a blast off starter Wick rides in the fourth inning with a man on Willoughby delivers then swings and he misses still has two more mom. Nobody throwing in the Cincinnati bullpen. As Kurt mentioned, two working for Boston. There's a bouncing ball foul off the third baseline. The Cincinnati bullpen, it has been so ballyhooed in this World Series, but I'll tell you, Boston's bullpen has simply been outstanding tonight. Nothing in two. Jim Willoughby against Johnny Bench. Ground ball third. There's Petroselli eating it up. I tell you, he's been amazing in this series. He's done it all with a bat, with a glove. He has an inner ear problem, and he almost has threatened to retire. He's been ill the last month, but he looks like he's 22 years old the way he's played in this series. That was a tougher play than it looked because he was right on the line protecting against the double. Had a long way to go to his left. That ball hit that area you described earlier, right around that seam near the dirt park. Here's a guy who could hit him a long way, George Foster. 23 home runs during the season. Hitless and two times up tonight has walked. Strike one. We know Willoughby so far has had it because they're hitting the ball on the ground. Only one man has hit the ball in the air against him. He's got that sinker ball. They're beating it down. On deck for Cincinnati, Davey Concepcion. Bottom out of the ninth inning with one man out of the base is empty, a 5 5 score. Burleson will play it from deep in the hole at shortstop. Uh -oh. And a nice play by Cecil Cooper as he uh -oh. saw that ball was going to take a hop, backed up, but still stayed on the bag to make the play on it and retire Foster. He's got a good arm. Luckily, he had the artificial surface to skip the ball off. Cooper makes a super play backing off on the ball. He had he stretched and gotten a funny hop. Burleson usually will throw you out on a fly on that one. He has a very deceiving arm, strong arm, a little rooster. So Jim Willoughby and out away from sending this game into extra innings. He has retired Bench and Foster on ground balls to the left side, and here's Concepcion. He homered in the fifth inning. Ground ball, easy pop for Petroselli. And that's all for the Reds as they go out meekly. One, two, three in the ninth inning. Three up, three down. And at the end of nine complete, it's a Reds five and a Red Sox five.
it appeared in the fifth inning that the Reds were going to bomb the Red Sox out of Riverfront Stadium when they took a five to one lead. They had back to back homers by Concepcion and Geronimo to increase their lead to four to one. And then Rose hit a triple off Rick Wise. He came in to score on a sacrifice fly by Morgan to make it five to one. And then what a superlative job. Reggie Cleveland. He retired four in a row, middle innings. Willoughby has allowed only one man to reach base the last three innings. They kept the Red Sox in it by checking the Reds completely, and the Red Sox went to work with a run in the sixth, a run in the seventh, and a two-run homer by Dwight Evans in the ninth to tie it. So we're going to the tenth inning. Five runs, nine hits, one error for the Red Sox. Five runs, five hits, no errors for the Reds. Doyle, Yastrzemski, and Fisk facing Raleigh Eastwood. The strike to Doyle, who's gone hitless in four times. Cooper, at the top of the order, went hitless in five. 0 for 9, the number one and two men in the Red Sox lineup. And yet they still tied this game. Strike two. And Yastrzemski's failed to hit. The hitting by the Red Sox has been down at the bottom of the order. Two strikes. Foul ball into the seats down the left field line. Nolan, Darcy, Carroll, McEnany, Eastwick. Here we are now, a pitcher facing batter from two shots. All the way on the left, and steady on the right. One ball, two strikes. Doyle leading off the 10th. Ooh, that was just outside. Two balls, two strikes. Bench thought they had the corner. A 2-2 pitch to Denny Doyle. Three and two. Perez right on top of that first baseline. Down at first. A 3-2 delivery. Bounding ball up the middle over for Morgan. No play. He wisely held on to it. He wasn't going to take any chance of a bad throw, an off-balance throw. And Doyle battled back from a two-strike count. That's the tenth hit for the Red Sox. Watch Morgan give way. He knows that Concepcion is the only one who has a chance to make a play. He just backed off. David, with exceptional speed, just couldn't get it on the high hopper on the artificial surface. The Red Sox have out hit the Reds double now, 10 to 5. Of the five Red hits, three have been homers and one triple. Yastrzemski rounded out twice, walked and struck out. And Borbone goes to work in the Cincinnati bullpen. High to Yastrzemski. A right-hander's on deck, Carlton Fisk. We're all tied, five up, 10th inning. You never know, do you? The Reds did it in Boston in the ninth. Now the Red Sox battle back tonight here when they look like they're out of it. Ball two to Yastrzemski. And the Cincinnati crowd is very uneasy right now. The 2-0 pitch to Yastrzemski. He hits a drive into deep center way back. Geronimo right up against the wall. A couple of feet higher, and the Reds were in real trouble. Geronimo gauged that one perfectly. Yastrzemski got his pitch, and he really leaned into it. Here's Geronimo displaying a great knowledge of his home park, going back very nicely, knowing when he hit that warning track, when he had to jump. He is a superlative center fielder, and I guess for a number of years, boys, we're going to hear who's better, Geronimo. Lynn throwing a few others too, I guess. Carlton Fisk homered in a second, nobody on. Walked twice, grounded out, bench to Perez. He's one out of two officially. One down, Doyle at first. We see it again, the catch by Geronimo, and as Tony says, he knows this ballpark like he knows the palm of his hand. He knew how much room he had. He made a little leap at the last second to bring it down, and 
The thing about this man is that he does things so effortlessly that a lot of people feel like he does not get the credit he deserves. The 1-0 pitch. A strike, a fastball. The Carlton Fisk, 1-1. One one. Fred Lynn is on deck for the Red Sox. Geronimo is playing Fisk straight away. Foster's more toward the line, and Morgan is shading second. Two balls and a strike to Carl Fisk. That's Geronimo. A lot of clubs in the American League will play Fisk over more toward left center field, so maybe they're going to try and keep the ball away, get him to hit the ball to center field. The 2 1 pitch. Runner going. Hit and run on. Bound to Morgan. Tag. Throw. Double play. The great part about this is that Morgan does not allow himself to get in the way of Doyle where he could have gotten upset and would not have been able to make that last throw to get the front end of that double play. Here it is again as the batter Fisk hits the ball on the ground and perfectly played as the runner goes. Morgan was heading toward the bag. He fielded the ball, tagged the runner sliding Doyle and got the easy double play of Fisk at first base. So now Jim Willoughby comes out in the last of the 10th inning. And he'll face Geronimo Eastwick, the pitcher, if they let him hit, and Pete Rose at the top of the order. Now, this coming Sunday, we'll have a big sports double header for you. If we have uh, Game 7 of the World Series in Boston, we would have the baseball world of Joe Garrett Joel at 1230, and the uh, baseball game followed by football with a feature game. The Oakland Raiders trying to bounce back from their stunning defeat last week by Kansas City against the undefeated Cincinnati Bengals. If the World Series is over, the lineup would be grandstand, then re regional football at 1 o'clock, Baltimore, New England, Miami and the Jets, that'll be a great one in New York, and the 4 o'clock games, Cleveland against Denver, Kansas City, San Diego, or well, the Oakland-Cincinnati game going across most of the country, and grandstand again. Either way, you're the winners, whatever happens on Sunday on NBC. Jim Willoughby's had an excellent sinker ball tonight. In the last two innings, eighth and ninth, he's got five ground balls out, all outs out of six. But he's had his trouble second and third times around facing hitters because they start laying off the pitch that is between the knees and the ankles. They force him to get behind. Then he has to come up with the ball and he gets hurt. Cesar Geronimo will start it off for Cincinnati in the last of the 10th inning. Give him a good hand for the catch. <laughs> Sit and watch ball games year after year. That Terry Crowley coming out on deck. Left-handed batter. Bounce foul. How many times when that player makes a great play in the field does he come in to lead off the inning? A left-handed pinch hitter, Crowley, will be up next. Cincinnati trying to get that rhythmic clap going for a rally. They had a 5-1 lead at one time. There's a strike in the inside corner. And Willoughby jumps ahead of him 0-2. Drago and Moret, right-hander, left-hander. All heated up and ready in the Boston bullpen. They're deep for Geronimo. Will it be just missing? Drago, the right-hander. Moret, the left-hander. One ball, two strikes to Geronimo. Hard ground ball. Base hit in the center field. Moret had the winning run on. Crowley was on deck, but now Sparky is going to... Good butter. He's done this before during the season, I believe, Marty. He's going to Ed Armbrister, who's an excellent butter. Saves him a left-handed pinch hitter by doing this. Ed Armbrister will bat for Raleigh Eastwick. And the winning run is on for Cincinnati in the last of the 10th inning. We're tied 5-all. The next inning games this season, the Reds won 11 out of 15. And the Red Sox won 8 out of 12. They're both tough. And that's really. 
Well, the Red Sox know this man's a good punter. At the cell, he's in tight at third. Cooper will be charging. The outfield straight away, not too deep. Willoughby makes the move. Had three steals tonight by the Reds. Foster, Perez, Griffey outside. Geronimo is a good base runner. He stole 13 out of 18 this year. Kurt, he's another one that Joe Morgan is hoping to work extensively with in spring training to try and increase his base stealing production as with Ken Griffey. Arm Brister hit a sacrifice fly. Tenth inning in the final game at Pittsburgh in the National League playoffs to provide the winning run. Throw to second. High. I thought this over to third. Safe. We are going to have that at second. We're going to have an argument. They may reverse this decision. The Red Sox are arguing. Interference at the plate. And they are saying that a batter after Buddy interfered with Carl Fist, the catcher, in fair territory. He has to give rules to Carl Fist so he can make the play. There's Daryl Johnson, Rico Petroselli. Apparently, home plate umpire Larry Barnett is not going to reverse his decision. He might, he might ask for help for somebody else. One of the other umpires who they feel might have had a better look. Well, let's wait and see what happens. That's what Daryl Johnson wants. He's calling first base umpire Dick Stello right now. Tony and Marty. Is that a gamble play of second by Fisk? Absolutely, Kurt. And, uh... Well, I'll tell you, to be honest about it, Tony, I don't know how you feel, but he may well have a valid argument, both Carlton Fisk and Daryl Johnson. Daryl Johnson right now is saying, I want to hear from Dick Stallo, but apparently Larry Barnett is saying, no, I made the call, I'm sticking with it. Daryl Johnson saying, he interfered with my man, my catcher, Carlton Fisk, in fair territory. And we're going to look at it again and see what we've got. Here is the butt with Geronimo on first. Watch this now. Fisk has got to have room. Armbrister right in his way. I have got to say right there, he interfered with him. I'd agree with you, Tony. Let's look at it again as we re-rack it. Daryl Johnson still wants an appeal to Stella or somebody else. Barnett saying, uh-uh. I made the call. It's going to stand as it is. Runners on second and third. Nobody out. Well, right so now, things look pretty hopeless. Here it is again. Armbrister making sure the butt is down right is in Fisk's way. Barnett is blocked out on the play. You can see he was blocked by Armbrister. Boy, that Fisk pot. I don't blame him. After you saw him had to throw over the batter, he knew a fast man was going, and he still tried to get him a second base. The throw skipped into center field. Kurt, a big, a big, big break for Cincinnati in a play that is destined to go down as a very, very controversial call on the part of Larry Barnett. And an error has been charged to Fisk. Mm. He's made two errors in this game. On throws the second. There's another angle, Tony. Here's another angle. Watch Fisk, watch Armbrister. There's Fisk. The ball is in fair territory. Armbrister is definitely in his way, and I believe, Kurt, the rule reads that you cannot obstruct, impede, get in the way of a fielder, a lot of other terminology, in fair territory. You've got to give the ground to the fielder. Offensive interference. Defensive interference is an act by a fielder which hinders or prevents a batter from hitting a pitch. Offensive interference, which interferes with, obstructs, impedes, hinders, or confuses any fielder attempting to make a play. Impedes, obstructs, hinders, or confuses any fielder attempting to make a play. If the umpire declares a batter, batter runner, or a runner out for interference, all other runners shall return to the last base that was. The judgment of the umpire legally touched at the time of interference. Kurt and Marty, it looked to me, there's the commissioner of baseball, Boy Q, talking to former American League president Joe Cronin, Hank Aaron right behind the commissioner, but it appeared to me that Armbrister did three or four of those things, interfere, impede, obstruct, <laughs> call it what you want, but he was in the way. Hank Aaron wasn't getting into the uh, <laughs> comment. He says, let him play ball. Well, this changes the whole strategy now. This throw was to try to nab 
Geronimo at second and went into center field. So Geronimo is the winning run now at third. Armbrister went to second. An error charged. A sacrifice and an error charged against Fisk. And now Roger Moretta's on. Pete Rose is the next batter. They have first base open. Rose is a switch hitter. And following him is a left-hander, Griffey. Two errors by Fisk in this game ties a series record for a catcher three times previously. The irony of that is that Carlton Fisk shouldn't have any errors. That throw he made to second base earlier might have been handled by Denny Doyle. And this one right here, well, we saw it. It'll be interesting in the post-game analysis if the score stands up, Cincinnati scores. If Larry Barnett, the home plate umpire, says he made the decision all by himself, he might have gotten blocked out from our camera angle, or if he did, appeal to Dick Stello or another umpire on the bases for help. All right, the Reds now have a great chance. Pete Rose is up. And uh, Fist looks to the dugout. they got to walk him. they got to put him on and hope with a force out at home or a force double play started at home. The outfield will come in. Long fly will win the game anyway. The infield will be in. This will load the bases with nobody out in the last of the 10th inning. And a play that I believe will go down as one of those controversial plays that you talk about for years to come in the World Series. As I recall, the World Series here not too many years ago, there was another controversial play at home plate involving Bernie Carbo when Kenny Burkhart was bumped, I believe, on the play. Some said he couldn't see it well, but he made a controversial decision. We're moving him in in the outfield. Way in. Merv Rettman now has come out. He's going to bat for Griffey. Yep. Sparky going with the percentages. Merv Rettman will hit for Griffey. Rettman's a right-hander. The outfield very, very shallow. All Rettman's got to do is do something. The Red Sox now will try and choke off Geronimo at the plate. Five to five, last of the tenth inning. There'll be a lot of arguing about that bunt by Armbruster. Did he interfere with Carlton's Fisk attempt to make a play? That's what the Red Sox were arguing about. That Fisk was interfered with. Rett fires a strike. He's a strikeout pitcher. He's got great stuff. He's not much of a ground ball pitcher. His fastball rides high most of the time, high and away, and they hit fly balls off in the right and left center field. One strike. There's a very, an outstanding fastball and a good curve. 114 and lost three this year. He was both a reliever and a starter. Never been in a tougher jam than this with bases loaded, nobody out. Last of the 10th inning, World Series game number three. The Reds at one time leading five to one. The Red Sox came back to tie it on Dwight Evans' homer in the ninth. Strike two to Merv Rettman. Oh, and two. Rogelio Moret. From Puerto Rico. 6'4", 175 pounder, Willowy. Now the two strike pitch. Just a piece of it by Rettman. He won some big ball games in July and August with that fastball. Here's the pitch. He tried to blow it by Rettman high and tight. Just got a piece of it. Then after that pitch, a conference on the mound. Moret and Fisk, as we look at Sparky. Looking over who Daryl Johnson's got left and a little scouting report also. He's got the book, huh? Moret's only 26, just turned 26. He's going over the hitters, it looks like, with Eastwick, in case they have to go back out there. A two strike delivery to Merv Rettman. High and away. The infield in, the outfield in. Bases are loaded, nobody out for the Reds in the last of the 10th. Geronimo started with a single. Armbruster trying to bunt. Fist trying to field the bunt. Scramble up at home plate. Fist threw the ball in the center field to set all this up. Curve is low, two and two count. Fist and the entire Red Sox team raging that Fist was interfered with. 
This is a good block by Fisk behind the plate. Bench has done this a couple times tonight, getting down, keeping the ball in front of him. We see Fisk do it now. Look at Rettenmund hanging tough, following that breaking pitch down. Two and two count. Bases loaded, nobody out. Five to five, last of the ten. Cook him out with a fastball. Rettman caught looking. He had something on that one. Now there's one out with a base loaded. And Joe Morgan, the batter. The outfield still has to play shallow. And the infield in. Three. If he did hit the ball on the ground, he's a tough man to double up. He had to go catch it at first. Now, Darrell Johnson trying to get the attention of one of his players. Three fine throwing outfield arms led by Dwight Evans and Wright. And they're all accurate arms. This is a job, though, where a pitcher almost has to do it himself. One down, base is loaded. Five to five tie. Curveball missing. One and oh to Joe Morgan. The Reds. There's the winning run, potential winning run, Geronimo. That's Arm Brisker at second. Pete Rose at first. One ball, no strikes to Joe Morgan. He had him going on that curve, one and one. I think Joe said, hey, that was, that was quite a curveball. Scouting report didn't tell me about that one. <laughs> He's noted for his fastball. Roger Moretta in the toughest situation he's ever been called for. That's a high pop foul coming back out of play. And now Moretz ahead of Morgan. One ball, two strikes. He came in here with the bases loaded, nobody out, and struck out pitch hitter Rettman. Now they're waving. They're trying to get uh, Evans. Evans in. They say you can't throw out Geronimo that deep. Get in there, even though you've got a fine arm. They wave him in shallower. That way he gets a little looping line drive or a little blooper. Still have a chance at a whole plate. One ball, two strikes to Joe Morgan. Morgan wins the ball game. That's it. They get credit for only one run batted in. And the Reds win it six to five. Joe Morgan getting credit for a single and a run batted in. Well, he drove in two runs tonight. And what a game we had, and we'll have controversy after this one over the bunt by Arm Brister in front of the catcher, Carlton Fitz. Final score, 6-5, to five, Cincinnati. Game three of the 75 World Series has been brought to you by...